At first, it was Crown of Thorns. Now it is the crown. And that is exactly the point because this is the Into the Darkness interview series podcast with my host, Tommy from Redefining Darkness, back again because we're going to get down and nerdy with Marco from The Crown. Happy to have you here, man. Nice to be here, guys. Thank you. So, because we are going to get really buried into this, I'd like to get more to the nerdier level with the guy that can get a little bit more nerdy and then hand it over to you, Tommy, to dive into our first question cool. and make it nice and long and short and sweet or whatever <laughs> we'll do here. Hey, Marco, what's going on, man? Just wanted to check in with you, you know, uh, being that uh, the state of things in the world is a little bit uh, questionable right now. Just wanted to see how it's going in the great north. You know, how's, how are the, the loved ones, family, friends, all that, everyone good? Yeah, it is crazy. It's a global craziness, and it's, uh, yeah, a lot of restrictions. And we don't have a complete lockdown here. Okay. But, uh, uh, yeah, of course, a lot of restrictions. And we've been, I've been working from home for like three weeks, and uh, my family is at home as well. Okay. So uh, um, it's basically, it's pretty diff- difficult nowadays because you can't plan anything. Uh, because uh, every day you hear some new shit and uh, new restrictions and everything, but uh, right. so far pretty good. Um, actually, our bass player got corona. Yeah, that's what you were telling me when we, we were talking yeah. uh, on the Facebook Messenger the other day. What, can yeah. you tell us a little bit about that? I mean, obviously he's recovered, correct? Yeah, exactly. Uh, he's recovered now. He said that he was the worst shit ever. It, the, wow. it was like, I think it was totally three or four weeks, but two of those weeks, he, he said, was pure hell. He was coughing fire, you know. It, wow. it was uh, really bad. So um, Now, does he live alone, or does he have family as well? He has family, and the thing is that, from what I understood, everybody got it except one. No. Oh. Uh, but Magnus got it really bad. Okay. So uh, that's also one of the scary thing with all this corona is that you don't know how bad it's going to hit you. Yeah, you don't so, know how it's going to affect you, right. Right. Yeah, exactly. Because I've, yeah, probably heard as well. I mean, people 90 years old and they survive it, and and then they're this 20 year old athlete, you know, <laughs> dies from it. So it's, right, uh, yeah. it's very hard. So uh, yeah, it, we we have a sort of family lockdown, but but it's all good. I'm I'm I have no problems being at home. I have everything right. I need. Here. Right. So, and, right. Uh, yeah, it looks like you got a space there to get things done. So if you can be in lockdown, you know, at least you can apply some ideas and get some tunes yeah. out of the way or whatever, you know. <laughs> yeah. Was the crown going to be doing a bunch of stuff, or you, or you personally, that this even affected anything, or or no? Yeah, it has actually affected a lot. Um, we haven't been able to rehearse uh, for maybe yeah five six weeks, and uh, this sad thing is that earlier today we decided that we need to postpone the recordings uh, you were set for you were set for may is that right exactly, exactly. Yeah. so that's not gonna happen it's uh, it's too yeah the whole fucking corona thing just messes up everything uh, from planning and of course there's the risk of you know five sweaty guys and other people <laughs> in the same room you know so uh, right. it's it's not just worth it uh, the sad thing is that we were so eager for May because, as you may know, we celebrate 30 years this year. Wow, so, yeah, that's uh, crazy, man. Yeah, so uh, we had this, like, uh, a plan that we record in May, deliver the Masters in June, so we can actually get the album released this year when we actually celebrate 30 years. Yeah, right. So, so that would be fucked up. <laughs> so, uh, Well, that's, that's, that's interesting then because 30 years, right, but... 30 years as the crown or where do you start that timeline because right. like i said in the beginning of this crown of thorns was i guess as far as i understood it you the the same band and then you changed your name to the crown or, or maybe it had a different uh, progression yeah exactly it's uh, we counted from when us idiots got together <laughs> so so that, that's uh, 1990 and we had shitloads of names and whatever and i think it was yeah, it was when we recorded our first demo in, must have been 90, 92, 93. That's when we uh, decided for Crown of Thorns. Okay. Before that, we had 
shitloads of stupid names like everybody else. <laughs> what, what were some of them do you remember any <laughs> oh yeah uh descended we had end of eternity we had cenotaph we had anathema was one. Oh, interesting. We had, so uh yeah it was always a a bitch because you try to come up with something and you were proud of it, and of course, there's another band yeah, with the course. same name. I See, was going to say, those are harder nowadays. I was going to say, yeah, yeah even, to, well, yeah, it, or maybe even easier because you have like metal archives. Or oh, you something. can look you stuff can, up, yeah, right. yeah. But like, I was going to say, those aren't too bad, or, or even some you know, like Cenotaph. That's already a band. But I see that was you obviously answered that in the midst of that thought. But uh, so obviously, yeah, thirty years from when the Crown of Thorns was a, a band, um, it, what was even the progression then? Obviously, you know, he said those those other ones were bad names. So then, Crown of Thorns was obviously a good name at some point, but then maybe not because then you changed it to the Crown. Or yeah, I guess my question regarding that did it have anything to do with getting signed to Metal Blade? Was there uh, some kind of conflict of uh, you know? Was there another band? Because uh, I, th- I, w- I want to say. I knew of a U.S. band with that name at some point, but I don't know if that was before or after you guys. Yeah, that's actually correct, but it wasn't due to Metal Blade because this happened uh, uh, at the uh, the end part when we were at uh, Black Sun Records when after right. we had released Eternal Death. So um, so we managed to get the Burning and Eternal Death released on the Crown of Thorns, mm-hmm. and um, then it was due to this American band they sort. Actually, they send uh, Black Sun Records a fax saying that uh, we're going to sue you if you don't change the name. And the s- silly thing is that uh, that band was backed up by Paul Stanley and Gene Simmons. Oh. Because he was sort of Paul Stanley's prodigy or something. There was this guy called John huh. B.R.B. or something like that that, that had this uh, Crown of Thorns <laughs> band. Okay. So, so, so we got this threat that yeah, they have decided that they're going to launch this project as Crown of Thorns, so it's not okay that you Swedes do it, because we will sue you. So uh, at that time, we were on this small label, so uh, yeah, there was no discussions. We said, we need to do something about it. And right. Of course, after two albums, it's terrible. And uh, But uh, yeah, so you, we went back into this hell where we tried to come up with something new, but <laughs> then... We just decide, okay, let, let's just shorten the name and right. the crown, and hopefully those who think of the crown think of Crown of Thorns. So, right. And, so. and then that Crown of Thorns, I mean, that didn't last, right? I mean, did, Oh, many, I think it was records, like, one record? Yeah, one or two albums. Yeah, something right. Like that. And I remember so, being terrible. That's all I remember. Yeah, it's not ever absolutely. listening to it again. No, it was some really disgusting <laughs> AOR rock, or something like that. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Christian, too. The Crown of Thorns they had to change their name to. You're saying sucked. The the uh, American one. Yeah, the, uh, the American Crown of Thorns. What was yeah. it? Do you remember? Like, I dude, I don't crown? remember, but I remember thinking it was going to be this Crown of Thorns. I'm like, oh, another. <laughs> I'm like, this doesn't look right. I knew like, I can't remember. We'll have to look it up. Maybe we can look it up in the midst of this interview and see if we can find an album cover of the American Crown of Thorns. But I remember it not looking right. But yeah. I, I, you know, you go after it anyway. I was young, you know. Yeah, because you don't and, and know. And there was no internet, you know. Right. Obviously, really. So, um, so yeah, I think I got it. And I was like, oh, what's this shit, you know. So, <laughs> yeah. As you can see, we, we did, I brought uh, my favorite two uh, fr- from uh, Crown, Crown of Thorns, whatever era you want to want to call it. But um, I do have the original. So, I had the Black Sun uh, <laughs> releases. All right. <laughs> Gotta get the OG. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And actually, that's from back then. I mean, that's old. I mean, that's not like something I went and got three years ago. That's like, you know, I probably got it in like ni- between 97 and 99, something like that. You were there? Because yeah. one day. Very fair. When did uh, Burning come out? Was that 96? I think 95. 95. Okay. 95. And uh, Eternal Death was 97? Yeah, 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 that's right. Okay, I'm trying to get my dates right. I did a little, did a little quick research this morning, so I wouldn't be a complete idiot. Um, so when listening to Crown of Thorns, and it's kind of interesting because you guys aren't from Gothenburg, but some would say there's some of that in there. But I also hear some of that Stockholm influence because, it, it, for me, and, and obviously I want you to chime in on, on how you feel about it. But for me, the Stockholm sound um, is very much influenced. More like I guess punk rock influenced or like Motorhead influenced and that kind of vibe, whereas I feel like the Gothenburg stuff is obviously more metal influenced with your know, Metallica, Slayer, and that kind of thing. Do you see it the same way? And and um, 
to kind of continue through that, what were the biggest influences at the beginning? Um, Because I feel like when you start, you wear a lot of those influences on your sleeve. And I happen to hear a lot of even like Unleashed um, in some of that earlier stuff. So, well, I guess what's your, where were you guys coming from? Yeah, exactly. It's like you said, we we, we don't live in either Gothenburg or Stockholm. We live live somewhere in between. And uh, I think that, and you're correct, in Stockholm it's more punk maybe uh, especially from Entomb coming from the autopsy thing and you know and uh, a bit more rough thing and Gothenburg always had this melodic thing that was very much coming from the you know Iron Maidens and all of that and right. trying to and even folk combine. right even like that Swedish yeah, yeah. kind of exactly yeah. in Flame really early combining the folk stuff and uh, right. that's cool and uh, for us uh, both scenes were very interesting uh, but what we very much focused on was was the uh, the Florida death metal stuff. Ah, cool. That was, uh, I mean, some really early stuff from demos and to the burning at least. Then there's a cutoff, but uh, the two demos and the burning, there's a lot of stuff that is basically D side ripoffs, you know. Wow. And uh, Morbid <laughs> Angel played backwards or riffs, <laughs> you know. So, <laughs> so we were heavily influenced by that and. Uh, I used to say that uh, since me and Magnus were the main uh, songwriters, right. and uh, Magnus was heavily influenced uh, from the Florida stuff, and I was more influenced by this uh, Swedish melodic stuff. Okay. So uh, I think it's still fair uh, to say it works in many ways when I sort of listen to even new songs, that there is this mentality. I'm the more melodic guy, and... Um, uh, Magnus is more into that in your face and you know metal very hard hitting music so uh, and when we started to sort of combine that stuff that we got into the more you know on the eternal death sound with it right right yeah you really started developing your sound I feel like on that one for sure yeah it's a favorite um, with that being said too is that where you know I and me and Reaper were talking about this uh, last night and even before the interview this morning is I was explaining to him, I, I feel like you guys were so cutting edge without without really knowing it or recognizing it. And I think, unfortunately, I think you're overlooked a lot because when you look at today and that whole this whole, like, I don't know what you consider this black thrash movement. <laughs> and even starting back, you know, this started, I would say, you know, uh, early, maybe 2006, 2007 with bands like Nephilim and um, obviously Midnight's a big one and... You have a million of them. You got Hell Ripper, which, you know, Reaper Metal actually released one of their records. And I know uh, Marco's a fan of Hell Ripper, actually. Oh, hell yeah. So um, I had the Wraith. You know, we all kind of have the bands that we've released under that tag. But you guys almost were a precursor to that. And not that you were this, uh, let's say, strict, you know, black thrash, because that it didn't even exist. But again, a precursor where I think you you almost started this whole uh, diss Right, the discharge influenced bands, the the dispheres, the uh, Huit yeah. system, um, the uh, Wolf, the Wolf Brigade. You hear all of that in your work, and it's like you guys always get overlooked. And I'm like, man, they really pushed that boundary before anyone was really doing anything like that. Yeah, in in a sense, I agree. It's uh, I think I think it's uh, come down to timing. Yeah, How yeah totally. That. Yeah, it's always, it's always that, and uh, I know that, especially from the Hell Is Here album, that's when we started to include a lot of the D beats and punk stuff, and uh, right. combine it with you know fast stuff. So, uh, and um, I don't know, it's um, I, I tend to hear that very very uh, very often that we were a bit overlooked and uh, uh, should deserve more attention or whatever. But I, I think it's. Yeah, it's, it has so much to do with timing. Right. It's uh, being in the right place. And maybe it's, well, it was a disadvantage for us not being from either Stockholm or Gothenburg because those bands usually got the most attention. Right. Uh, so that can also be a factor. But um, but yeah, when that sort of style came back, came, yeah, came back you know, later on, yeah. it's, uh, I, I felt very much at home, <laughs> you know, hearing that stuff. Right. I sort right. of... And that mentality, what are you trying to achieve there? Mm-hmm. So, uh, 
Well, yeah, you know, it's and and, and timing is a, a really key word because, like you just said, you know, it, it could, it, it very much could have been a lot with the timing. And so, what I was going, what I always kind of just had in my head about the crown was like, so for instance, there's a, a Canadian band from Toronto called Rammer. I don't know if you've ever heard of, and. It just sticks in my head because the vocal style of that is very much kind of reminiscent to the crown style. And I think that at least I would always cite that like, not that that's like something overly original, but like there's a unique style, at least, you know, on like Death Race King and stuff where it's probably, you know, very prevalent, uh, you know, as far as that style um, that, you know, that I, I, would, I would call the crown vocal style and, that I hear in, in Rammer. And so just having that thought, it was like, you know, I'm like putting time frames together. Like, you know, that's very much like a late 90s, 2000s kind of sound. And so when you're saying that it's, you know, year 30 really for the band, that's where maybe timing might now be uh, of an essence even more that we because we very much like what you know tommy just described like you know having these bands where it's kind of like these clone styles where they worship things especially the worship thing like that's just it's it's beaten to a pulp at this point where you know especially the styles that everybody worships like how many freaking motorhead things to the point that we see the umlauts over and over <laughs> right, and over right that's like shit at this point if you see the logo and the umlauts and you're sick of that don't even bother because you right. already know and then you know then there's bath worship and so on and so forth that for one when it came to you guys like it doesn't it, there was no fad to be like oh we're gonna do Jump that. On that train right so i don't think and i would be curious to know uh, although i think the answer is very purely organic that you just kind of you know went to the well of like what you're influenced by but what i was going to say is that time may be of the essence now that you're on your 30th year that we're in this whole retro scene where basically it's cool to either rip off something or cite an influence and then like be very heavily into that that maybe now that it's year 30 you might see some crown ripoffs i don't know like yeah, but right. what is your thoughts though on this like you know uh clone uh style like is it something boring to you or do you, do you embrace it and find it attractive oh i know the especially today with the, all the facebook's uh some people uh, get in touch with me and they, they want to send me a song because they've been so inspired by uh, some Crown song or Crown era or something like that. And for me, that is uh, that, that's just beautiful. Yeah, it's really amazing to hear. And also, because we traveled quite a lot through the planet, and uh, it always surprises me when I when I meet people how. Excite, or, well, not excited, but how <laughs> genuinely they have loved the band during the years. I mean, they're they're pissed that we're not the biggest band in the world, and they they <laughs> they really love a lot of the stuff. I mean, really hardcore fans, and that really warms my heart. I think it's beautiful. Yeah, and that like from all over the world, yeah, and uh, that's um, that's absolutely amazing I mean, we've never been the biggest band or most selling band or whatever but it's always been very clear that the, the people that are into us they are really into us and uh, so uh, that's beautiful yeah because it's almost like when you're um i guess citing influence or something or, or basically if you're really doing this worship genre that i'm describing or something and and that thing like and you're, and you're one of those popular bands when everybody flocks to something and it's basically a trend it's almost like if you receive that status where it's just all at once, that's the stuff that's like a flash in the pan uh, to give it a label that doesn't seem to last through the ages where it's always kind of the stuff that, you know, yeah, it doesn't get like this huge, uh, you know, trend essentially attached to it. But always just kind of like looked at, oh yeah, like how are the, yeah, yeah, how did these guys get overlooked? Like any band that you can almost say that about that is still hailed with regard when it is looked at. But yeah, I usually always deemed overlooked. Those are the ones that always continue to survive and maybe at some day does like get really popular and then remains. Right. But it always seems like that's like the formula. Like if it well, was all in well, because it's genuine, and I think yeah, you know, the crown being true to themselves, they never did jump on any of these bandwagons. And again, they didn't even ex exist. Um, they were just way ahead of the time, and I think um, again, that's that lasting power because it was it was organic and it was you know genuine. Was, yeah, there was no umlauts in the O. Yeah, yeah. Was there <laughs> yeah, was there ever a thought to put an umlaut over the the O? That's a good question. 
<laughs> what was that? Was, was there ever a thought to put a umlaut over the O to make it motorhead? <laughs> It may have happened sometime, but it was quickly. <laughs> yeah, good idea. We we yeah. approve of the no umla. Well, uh, but explain why though, because like not that like because I'm I'm because I'm so in up to speed with that. Like no, don't do it. But not in like oh my god, that's garbage. Why would you want to be associated with motor or anybody do it? But like especially then because like it wouldn't have been oversaturated. It wouldn't have been a thing. So yeah, I'm kind of curious why the the no. <laughs> well, it is. I mean, if. If it wouldn't have been overused, it would have been interesting. But uh, I mean, we, we've always been a bit sensitive that we don't want to go into the most typical cliche traps. Right. You know. Right. So, yeah. Uh, I mean, <laughs> we actually had a discussion because our uh, the title for our coming album it could be done. Uh-huh. So uh, so it was a discussion for maybe. A few seconds, but it was like, no, 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 no. It's overused. It's overused. Yeah, totally. So, in today's climate, for sure. But if you would have done it, yeah. Oh, back in the then, early two thousands, everyone would be like, oh shit. And they're like, what's yeah. this? Is kind of cool. Yeah. yeah. Which could have been some of the uh, attraction to the crown, even of that time too, because it has a lot of that thrash element. Where right. like you know you got to keep in mind, it's hard to remember. But like you know what, nineteen ninety nine, early two thousands. Like I remember, you know, like decapitator comes to mind. Where like that was like a lot of people getting like excited, you know, about a uh, decapitator because they're playing old school thrash, and it's like because that was like just like washed up by yeah, no, it was Matt like Harvey. washed yeah. up by then to even do that. So it's like, and I think that might even be some of what worked for the Crown because it it never it never went away. You know, it was right. always there. There was still that thrash element. Right. I, I mean, I don't know. Is that something you would agree with, uh, Marco? Yeah, yeah, sure, absolutely. And was it more of a thrash influence, or was it more of that kind of punk rock uh, Motorhead influence? Where where does that kind of D beat influence stem from? Like where where was that being pulled from? Yeah, uh, it's always so damn difficult to analyze your own music. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know, I, not at all. I know, I know that when these kind of questions comes up, you, you really start to think about it. what the hell are we doing and where does everything comes from? But I know that from very early on, we have listened to a very wide range of rock and metal. Yeah. I, mean, I remember already like in 94, we were listening to like Motley Crue and that wasn't allowed, right. you know, so right. that wasn't okay <laughs> at all. To like. So, so, but we like that old, more punkier Motley Crue style. Uh, the early stuff. stuff. Yeah. And uh, also, Magnus did bring in a lot of that rock and D-beat ideas. And, I mean, the D-beat stuff is also related to the grindcore era. Right. Uh, so, um, and s- somewhere we sort of realized that it doesn't necessarily make it a better song when it's always blast beat. You know, uh, a D-beat can sound more energetic than right. a blast beat. Totally. Especially. So if you find that good riff, you know, that and that and or something, and you just debeat it over, it sounds really intense. Right. So, so it usually happens is like if Magnus comes up with one song with a sort of new idea for us, or I do it, then we sort of use it for a while, uh-huh. and and then something interesting comes in from somewhere, and we use it as well, and. Of course, thrash has always been there. I mean, it's in the in the in the spine, in the DNA. Right. So, um, and pretty early on, we sort of decided that we shouldn't be afraid to sort of blend this stuff as long as it, the end result is a good song. Right. So, um, I know very a lot of bands when during our, our era the. It's basically the same formula all the time. Exactly. Uh, yeah. It, it's not bad. It, it, I mean, it, it works for a lot of bands. Uh, but for us, we got bored very quickly when we had five songs sounding like uh, thrash, death metal, or whatever. Right. So uh, then we wanted to do something else. And maybe I had an idea okay, let's make a slow song or, wh- or whatever. You yeah, know? Yeah. So yeah. Uh, it's always been interesting to. to re- Keep that sound, but you know, really try to you know see what's out there in in the you know horizon. Right. Yeah, because it is still about that timing, you know. Because again, like where where this would all fall a lot 
had happened, was happening, and and it's all these mindsets because you had, you know, uh, before that would have been you know, like the genre war between black and death metal, right? And then you would have had basically the Gothenburg blew up. Then Gothenburg blew up, but then you would also just kind of had like the vanishing of thrash, the more like ex- the focus for extremity. And so I, I just think that that's interesting to hear that that was even kind of uh, a conscious effort to be like, hey, we we've had enough blast we beats or something, up, yeah. Because everybody was about that, like you know, this blast, 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 right? You know, especially that, that era, for yeah. sure, yeah. And I think that's what makes the crown kind of so tasteful, for lack of a better word, because there is there's a lot of everything, but yeah, it's just. But at the end, of the same token, you would definitely you can label the crown as just a, a full out just you know very fast band yeah but even having that uh you know th- that uh, those f- varieties to, to, to you know switch it up well i think it's a cool thing and you know i think we've nailed it on the head a few times but i think with the crown so effortlessly was able to do successfully was to blend all those styles yeah. like you said and you did it in a unique way and you did it successfully and i think that's the difficult thing i think a lot of bands that have tried something similar maybe it didn't work or maybe they they go too far one way or the other where they're like, this is our thrash song and this is our d yeah. song. And then it's too compartmentalized where you guys were always able to blend it. I mean, to this day, and we'll get into um, Cobra Speed Venom a little bit later, but to this day, you, you, you're still doing it. You're, you've kind of created that. This is the crown sound. And you kind of in, incorporate all those elements probably without even having to think about it. Uh, anymore it's just what you guys do and i think that's what's so cool about it and that's what attracted me to the crown so the band obviously uh evolved from the crown of thorns era to uh what became hell is here and and all that but as a fan though you know sometimes when bands change uh you know people get pissed off because they liked that how the band sounded you know at the beginning and they're like why did they fucking change like carcass or something <laughs> well you right i mean what but even be? them i, I actually love the change right right but same with the crown like i never got upset i just felt like it was a natural evolution i actually got more into <clears throat> you um with that evolution you know so uh i just thought that's that was kind of interesting because a lot of people do get attached maybe to a certain sound and then when they start incorporating some of this other stuff and really just you're just finding yourself is all you're doing really you're growing as a band you know obviously and you started young too um so the climate around you it's kind of interesting because at that time it was right as gothenburg was about blowing up you had um a, a slaughter of the soul coming out Right around your Crown of Thorns era. So how big of an effect did that have on kind of the whole scene? And then um, it's kind of funny because I consider when we look at contemporaries of the Crown, I don't really look at At The Gates and I don't look at In Flames or any of those bands. I actually look at like yeah. Witchery and um, Witchery in particular, actually, yeah, yeah. because I they had that thrash. Didn't think about that until just now. Yeah. And it was more just like the Crown and Witchery kind of doing their thing. And really, no one else was blending those styles um, as much as as those two. Well, I, I would say they were they were the first that I really noticed blending those right, styles, right. getting away from Gothenburg, or you know what I mean, creating their own kind of niche. So, I just am curious what that was like at the time, especially being from Sweden um, when when they kind of exploded. Yeah. It's uh, first of all the witchery thing. I totally agree. It's well uh, from my perspective, it's one of the few bands where I can see that we have a lot of things in common right. when it comes yeah. to our uh, approach things and uh, even like when you do this sort of black and trash stuff you still have the choruses and all of that you know it's I, I think for me it's a lot it's the same mindset and I know when I talk to Jens so many times about it we, we sort of had a lot of jokes about it but, but that why don't we tour right right <laughs> why don't we, exactly why don't we do that? What, we, what we we used to call it like a uh, witch creek blitzcraft tour, a witchery craft <laughs> or something like that, you know, and uh, that would uh, be really great. But the Slaughter of the Soul stuff is uh, uh, the Slaughter of the Soul e- explosion actually never happened. Ah. But um, the thing is that uh, I love At the Gates, uh, a lot of the, especially the old stuff, they've right. been influences in the melodic stuff and whatever. But uh, I remember that we were we played on uh, at the gates release party for Slaughter or Soul. Oh wow! As an opening act, and there was maybe eighty people. Oh okay. 
Yeah. <laughs> Crazy. So, Imagine now. <laughs> explosion. So actually, Slaughter Soul became a sensation after they quit. So yeah, that's um, kind of crazy. They, they said, I mean, they have always been a hard touring band with the old Peaceful albums and all of that. Sure. And uh, then they released Slaughter Soul. It wasn't an instant uh, boom. Right, so, right. Then we did a lot of touring, I know, with More Angel and Dissection in the US and yes. stuff like that. Yeah. So they, sort of collapsed, right. but um, it took a while after they quit when it super exploded, Right, and, uh, especially globally. In, in, in Sweden, with a lot of metalheads, we enjoyed Slot or Soul right away, but then later on, it became a sensation, and it was a thanks to a lot of those you know, metalcore bands from the U.S. that basically just copied <laughs> Slot right. or Soul. Right, totally, you know, totally. You know, early on metalcore bands, Shadows Fall, uh, and all that, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, and then those people and bands sort of start to wonder where where, where does this come from, and everything pointing to Slaughter or Soul, and uh, then it became a sensation. Right. It's kind of funny because I do remember I got the record before the tour with Morbid Angel and Dissection came through. I was young, man. I, I had to been fourteen, maybe. So, uh, but I will say the reason I got onto At The Gate so quickly, at least with Slaughter of the Soul, and I had not had the previous albums yet. I had not gotten into At The Gates until Slaughter of the Soul, actually. But, I, you know, I was young. I, I subscribed to all the European magazines. So I, I had subscriptions to Terrorizer and Metal Hammer because no one was covering At The Gates here. Metal Maniacs hadn't jumped on it yet, but all the European mags were freaking out about it. And so um, I remember... And Terrorizer, not only did they cover the record, but I think the first thing I saw mentioned was like Terrorizer used to do like the live gigs, like the reviews of live shows. And they did a review of uh, At The Gates Live right after the release. And um, I read it and they were just raving about them, being like, this is the next rain in blood and this is this and blah, 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 blah. And so I just remember reading that and that sticks in my memory. And I remember being with my mom at the mall or something and kind of forced her to get it for me. It was like probably a month or two after it had come out. So I got it really early on. And then when they came, I, I was a huge Morbid Angel fan, and I loved that record, the Domination record they were touring for. But it was like a Thursday night. So I was 14 and you know a freshman in high school or something. So there was no way my parents were letting me go on a Thursday night by myself uh, to a metal show, you know. <laughs> so I missed it, and now it sucks because that was one of these famous tours, you know, that I could have been there, you know, it was in my city. But, uh, but I think... For me, it started there. So I kind of saw the hype near the beginning because the European magazines were so on top of them. Um, and yeah, and actually my bands back then, I was in a band called Embers to Ashes, and we, we totally rode that train as well. But I think, and again, we never released anything, so I, I'm not trying to pat my own back here or anything, but we were on that. I think just because we were so in tune with the European scene at the time where not a lot of people were, more of the old school guys maybe, and I was always hanging out with some of the older guys, you know, older than me. So, uh, but anyway, uh, we can, we can move on from there. I'm actually curious about the band's hiatus. Um, cause I, okay. So actually before we get there, I want to talk to you about your tours because I did see, I want to say I saw all three tours before the hiatus. So, and, and maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you came more than three times, but hell is here. Were you, was, were you playing with, um, were you opening for arch enemy when Johan was in the band? Was that, I was trying to remember who you toured with for the Hell Is Here tour. I can't remember who you played with. That was a, a super cool package. It was with uh, Cannibal Corpse, uh, Nile, Creasy, and... But I thought that was the um, Death Race tour. It could be. Yeah. <laughs> I could be wrong. That's, that's <laughs> the Death Race tour, because I do remember Chrissy and Cannibal Corpse, and you were you were opening, but that was Death Race. So I was trying to remember... <laughs> U.S. Uh, two times. Oh, so maybe I'm so, just confusing it with something else. So, so I did see you on the the Death Race tour, and I saw you on the Crown in Terror tour, because I saw you with with uh, Tompa. Yeah. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, exactly. So though, I uh, swear you, you had a tour for us when we played with uh, Darkest Hour. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> I didn't see that one, but I saw those first two. So, well, I guess quickly, and, and this is something you probably covered a million times, but Johan leaving the first time. 
or, or did he leave or did, or did you guys uh, ask him to leave? And then the whole uh, Tompa thing, was it always meant to be um, a flash in the pan? Was it was he just filling in kind of thing? Like, I guess, how did that whole thing happen? And then we can kind of get into the hiatus. Uh, yes, it was uh, Yuan's decision to leave. Okay. And it, uh, the, it came as a shock to all of us. Uh, because we were basically the same guys from the start. Right. And uh, we've been doing this since we were 14 years old. So it, it came like a shock. But also... And at like more like the height of your popularity. Like you were really starting to make waves at that time. Yeah, yeah exactly. And, uh, <clears throat> and also, yeah, we were growing. And at the same time, we all know that... Uh, Death metal is a hard business to be in because it was always this balance that we were getting more and more attention, more and more sort of tour offers, and uh, we wanted to do everything. But uh, when you sort of open up for you know bigger bands, we did open up for like Morbid Angel and Emperor, a lot of you know high-profile bands, and uh, you basically you know you know you pay to play, right? Because yeah. we had a uh, sort of plan that. Okay, do we want to go out and headline for 100 people, or do, do we want to join Morbid Angel and play for 1,000 people? And right. let's see where it goes from there. So that's usually the, how it works. And it just became pretty brutal lifestyle, so to say. And um, in the end, Johan just felt that uh, I can't do this anymore. So uh, it was his decision. Okay. And then, obviously, uh, Tompa came in. And then what was the, the reasoning behind re-recording uh, Crowned in Terror, you know, Crowned Unholy with Johan back. What, what, what was uh, the reasoning behind that or the, or the reason for that? I think that's one of our stupidest decisions. <laughs> um, there's nothing wrong with both Crowned in Terror and Crowned Unholy. It's just that for me, Adam, now afterwards, I just don't think it's uh, a band should re-record an album. Right. No matter how shitty or whatever it sounded because... Uh, now, as from a fan perspective, I would hate to see like a re-recording of, you know, Death Leprosy with symbolic sound or whatever. You know, it right. doesn't, doesn't fucking make sense. So, right. uh, uh, but I remember when we were discussing Crown on Holy that uh, we it made sense at that point yeah. because now Yuan was back and oh, it would be so cool to still be able to say that oh, we have all the albums, you know, with Yuan as singer and right. so. Uh, but uh, no, in retrospect, it's it, it's not a good idea. Uh, I don't like that at all. I have problems listening to it. <laughs> well, it's kind of funny because at the time, I wasn't so mad at it because I actually would have preferred Johan on Crown and Terror, you know? Uh, I actually prefer his voice with you guys. Not that I thought, uh, you know, Thomas did a bad job or anything, but, um, but he was so overused at that time, right? And he... He had all these different projects. I mean, he really, after Out the Gates, he got super busy um, with so many bands that he was doing. And so when he joined you guys, I was like, oh, cool. He should be in a band like this because he was doing a lot of different stuff. Um, but at the same time, I thought Johan's vo vocal style was a little more vicious. And uh, well, at least with you guys, I thought it, it, he was always a better fit. It was like more natural, maybe. I don't know. It was fun to do it. I mean, it's not very often you have a chance to sort of revisit a, a recording and do, do you know, there was a, I think we re-recorded the bass line or, or the bass guitar for uh -huh. the album. Otherwise, everything is original. And uh, it was fun to do. And everything was sort of done with also respect for both singers because, the, you know, the last track, Death Metal Holocaust, there's this duet with Johan. And, uh, so, I mean, it's... Right. Uh, it, I think that all the decisions we've done uh, when it comes to changing members, it's, uh, it's we, we've gotten a lot, you know, on gut feeling, and you you have a friend that you know that's. You know, I mean, it's it's not a like a super political decision. It's a, it's a very easy in the band. That, uh, I remember when we were discussing what we we're gonna do after Johan, it was like, well, we'll tell Tompa is a good guy. I mean, he did guest vocals on Death Wish King, and we toured with the. Uh, yeah, Tompa with another band, and uh, so it, it was like the, the only choice, uh, the first option, first and only sort of right, option. And, right. Uh, as you said, at that point, he was doing shitloads of projects, maybe not a main band, but it was a lot of projects. And uh, right. 
and uh, we asked him, and yeah, it was very very easy, and we went to work. So. Uh, and what happened? What, what was the dis- disillusion of that? Um, was it him? Was it you guys? Uh, I'm sorry. What do you mean? The dissolution between you and, and oh. Thomas. Then was it, was he only doing it for one record, or was he in it to kind of to do, to go with the long haul, or did you just guys all find like uh, it's just not working with with us? Yeah, the, the, we never planned that. Yeah, let's do only one album with him. I mean, also later on with with Jonas, the plan was always that this is our new singer, and right. uh, let's go. And uh, uh, yeah. We came to a point that we we we, we knew that this is not going to work yeah. for various reasons, and uh, that was it. And okay. um, things happen. And then uh, obviously he came back, and uh, Possessed Thirteen happened. And to me, that record really just fell flat at the time. It's funny I was talking to J Dog, who people uh, listening in know from. Uh, Reefer's show Hellcast that they've been yeah. doing for friggin' 15, 20 years, whatever it is. But uh, <laughs> J-Dog was saying that he didn't like Possessed 13 either when it came out, but he actually really likes it now. So that's one of the records I've been starting to go back to. Um, but did that feel like the beginning of the end for you guys? Or did, was that kind of just like a normal thing and uh, you know, you guys didn't even feel like the end was coming until later? Yeah, I, I can't really exactly remember the f- full flow, but I do remember that um, we intentionally, for Possess 13, really wanted to uh, uh, include uh, the all sort of historic rips that ended up in the closets. We I, I think we were fully aware of that we will empty everything on this album. So uh-huh. the, the, uh, I agree with you. It sounds flat. Uh, it's not one of my favorite albums. Yeah. Um, there's a there's a different feel to it. Yeah, totally. And and uh, there's also a lot of lot of riffs uh, that are from way way back. From they didn't ended up even on the demos, you know. Wow. So uh, really old, eh, 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 very very simple stuff, you know, yeah, four yeah. chord uh, punk stuff. And yeah, we we really used everything we had after that. So. Um, that was the, like the first time after Possess 13, we were on totally zero. We had no ideas. So, uh, <laughs> well, it's cool that you explained it because now I can go back and listen and go, oh, okay, this this is where they're coming from, um, and kind we of listen to it with the, fresh the, ears. You know, uh, the, the, there's this bonus disc there, uh-huh. uh, and, and there we also included all our demos and really weird. Uh, 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 sort of uh, first recordings we did uh, for like youth center and stuff like that. So huh. if you really listen to the bonus track, if you are very familiar with the uh, crown uh-huh. and uh, possess team, when you start listening to those tracks, you'll say, Oh shit, that's from that. song. oh, that's from that. <laughs> so that's, that's how we usually work, you know, so that's awesome. sometimes you play with a riff and 15 years later, yeah, it fits in this new song. <laughs> Let's bring it back. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I want, and, and that kind of makes me go back to uh, the remark about re-recording an album, because I was going to say, you know, I, for one, yeah, I'm kind of the same mind where it's like, okay, yeah, if this is like a classic album, like... If it's a know, moment in time, like, leave it that moment in time. But I'm also the other way around, where I, I get it, yeah. but then I also think, because, like, imagine, like, Misfits or, like, Venom or, or really a lot of old bands... Were like Angel Witch comes to mind and bon- when you're talking about bonus discs. So like you know the the first Angel Witch album, uh-huh. you know you can get that beautiful CD set, and it does. It comes with like the seven inches of stuff, so you get various uh, versions of like you know Loser or whatever. I don't even know if that was on the album, but you know I mean like you get yeah. different variations that I actually like sometimes the seven inch version better. So. Whereas more so of a fan rather than just, you know, of your own music, A, do you like what I just described? And B, where does that line then cut off where if you do like that, where it's safe to record maybe a seven inch and maybe a song, is it is that the difference where you can do like a, a few songs? Or not doing can't, a whole yeah, record, yeah, yeah, yeah. Would you agree with that or what's your stance on that? I agree. Uh, I think it's okay to do a song here and there. Maybe we record or... Uh attempt a different style or version but we have done that as well but we have always always used those as a, sort of bonus material yeah, uh, yeah. We, uh, later on with um, 
couple of songs from Eternal Death when we did Doomsday King. Uh, we also recorded, but those are sort of spread on maybe a Japan bonus or yeah. it's, it's a sort of necessary evil to do since you're forced to do bonus stuff. So you try to do <laughs> right, something. something. Right, right. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know? So uh, that can be fun to do one song, but uh, I mean, as you say, like Misfits or Venom, uh, I mean, Misfits sounds terrible production wise and everything, but for me, that's how <laughs> the way sound it makes it yeah right yeah because if i would hear that with tight drums and uh, i mean good guitar sound it wouldn't be at all my image of misfits so, right uh, totally so totally well yeah. it's funny uh you know there's not many bands that we could probably name that have re-recorded an entire album but one that comes to mind that i actually like liked was testament uh first strike still deadly when they re-recorded a lot of their early stuff because I think for them it was more of just like we've been around for so long all these new fans that we have we don't even know if they know our back catalog and they kind of brought it up to date with with Sneep and you know whoever did it I think he did it but but I actually really li- like that one so well probably even pr- maybe uh, more spot on to what was just described here because I think we I think we all collectively kind of have the same uh, opinion on the matter sure on um, Grant I mean. Yeah, I can't think of a, a full like re-recorded album that I love. Although I know there's like one. Um, actually, I like that Twisted Sister one where they did a uh, "Stay Hungry," only still hungry. Okay. Um, but I like that like where like the hits aren't the ones that are the better songs. It's like the off songs, the B-side ones. Yeah. Yeah, because it's a little bit like because they always said like they didn't like the production of it, which is probably every band's bitching of re-recording a whole album. Problem, anyway. right? Yeah. But I actually kind of like that because like you hear the bass and stuff better. But actually, uh, Sodom doing the what was it the first album they did yeah or in the Sign of Evil something where it would have been basically kind of what Marco just said with the uh, Misfits and being sloppy and now here it's all tight right and perfect, that's like yeah. but when they did it they, they didn't make it tight at all <laughs> so it was like I, I don't really know what the point was at that point um but i don't know I, it was just more so something of the more of uh, uh the fandom uh right to, to kind of just get some insight about so that's at least where i <laughs> yeah no i think yeah totally relevant um i wanted to to kind of get back on track though uh with the timeline and talk about the hiatus because right after possessor 13 obviously it seemed like you know, you guys had, had uh, run your your course. Uh, what was the feeling at the time? Were you guys just burnt out? You know, what was the general sense that you guys just said, eh, you know, let's, let's this. well, yeah, let's get rid of this or, or get some time away? Yeah, I think burnout is a, is a good word for it. It's uh, also with Possess 13, it started to grow. I mean, we're doing amazing, you know, walking festivals and stuff like that. It's, right. It was... It was uh, from sort of career perspective, it, it was the stupidest thing to do to quit. Yeah. But uh, but I'm very very confident that if we would have continued for three four more years, we would have ended up like miserable fucks that would have never played together again. <laughs> I'm pretty sure of it. So yeah. so for us, it was the best thing that could ever happen because the the thing is, as I said, we started playing when we were 14. Right. And. Uh, that was that was the only thing in our mind. We never had any proper jobs or anything. I mean, we, we were basically talking within the band that do not get a good job because you always need to quit it and be able to tour and you know do the stuff. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, obviously there was no uh, kids or families or whatever. So uh, right. it was always band, 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 band. So uh, we felt burnout. Uh, we we had to do something else and basically to get our normal lives shaped up. <laughs> right. Well, what, well, like you said, once you get to a certain age, all that stuff does start to play a factor, and you kind of do need yeah. to figure out your finances and, like, am I still going to live yeah. out of this shit apartment? Like, I kind of, like, would like something nice, you know, or, yeah. or whatever it may be. Yeah, the Mr. Metal attitude does Yeah, it, well, it, some people life, live like that, and they could be a no matter of vagabond and have no possessions, but a yeah. lot of people, like, want to move on with their life yeah, and grow. A, life's going to kick you in the ass uh, naturally in that regard. Yeah, <laughs> totally. A couple of years after we quit, uh, I went to visit a festival and met some, you know, metal friends and uh, I'm not going to name any names, but there were a lot of people saying, I wish we could quit, but we can't do it. Wow. Oh, wow. We're doing this 200 shows per year and, you know. They were so, like dependent. Uh, because, that was their career. They were like, we don't have anything to fall back on. Right. So, uh, so uh, it is frustrating to be in that because 
I swear, 100% of all musicians I know, they are doing this not for the money because obviously there aren't, isn't any sort of income in there. Right. So uh, we are all just super fans and we do it for the, you know, for the music and the love of that. Yeah. So, uh, but later on in life, it, it becomes challenging because as you said, somewhere at point, mama's not going to pay your bills anymore and uh, you right. need to, you need to step up. So, uh, so it was a good time uh, for that apparently. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so for us, uh, when we think about uh, back at it, the sort of hiatus we had, it was the best thing that could ever happen because some people went to school, we started families, we, we you know started to grow up a bit, you know. Right, right. So not the word, but um, so um, yeah. Was it, it meant have... to be a hiatus, or was it a ending of the band, and you guys just ended up getting back together, or was it meant to be like, eh, we'll revisit this in a couple of years, or was it just like, this is over, it's done, and you didn't expect to get back together? We split it up. Okay. That was the, that was, that was, this is it. The, the, Got the it. band is over. So, uh, so that's also, I think, why we sort of, yeah, could relax a bit about it, because it wasn't like a three-year-old plan or something, is it? Right. It was like, it, we don't have a band anymore, we don't have commitments so, um, yeah, as I said, we focused more on the sort of normal grown-up stuff. And uh, But after a while, I mean, after a year or whatever, I mean, it's, even though, though the band split, it's not like I can stop writing music. Right. So I know you had so Angel, after, Angel Blake, right? Is that where you put yeah. all your stuff into? Yeah, exactly. So after a while, I was like, I got 10 songs. What am I going to do? <laughs> you know? So... so uh, uh, and I talked to Metal Blade about it, and uh, Michael Trenger, the guy there, he was like, yeah, let's release it, let's, uh, let's uh, send me a demo, let's listen to it. And, and what I did know is that I didn't want to do anything sort of uh, Crown Mark II or this is going to compete with the Crown. I, right. I intentionally wanted to do something else. And I always had this very sweet spot for like this mid-tempo metal music, like Paris Lost or whatever sentence, sure. you know. So that was my idea that, okay, let's do it with clean vocals and, and <laughs> uh, is that Obsidian one? <laughs> I don't, the new I don't, one? No, 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 no. I don't actually no. remember when I got this, but uh, no. maybe like five years ago, something like that. But I wore it for you today specifically, but we can talk about that later. I don't mean to cut All you right. off. So uh, that, was, that was my, I'm going to do something else. I'm going to do with clean vocals. I'm going to. I'm going to write the vocal lines myself. Uh, be, I'm going to do something challenging, you know, yeah, and right. of course the megalomaniac stuff to re- play all the instruments myself <laughs> as well. So, uh, so uh, it was interesting <laughs> in many ways. I own so, the record. I have it. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, as I said, it, it became so silly after, after a year, like, okay, I got shit loss of song. What are we going to do? We're gonna <laughs> right. So, um, and, like a year after that, it, uh, no, a, cu- a couple of years, of course, after that, same thing happened with Magnus. Uh, he was like, I got, I got 10 trash songs. What are we going to do? <laughs> <laughs> and that, uh, when he, okay, now we're jumping a bit about that. That was the, prior to Doomsday King. He's like, uh, I got 10 trash songs. And uh, do you want to play guitar with me? <laughs> and, like, <laughs> and he asked Jan, Jan, do you want to be the drummer? And I said, sure, let's do it. And, the, the, the plan was to do a, a project called Doberman. Uh, it's going to be like like, a, like the like the dog Doberman. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And uh, that was the plan. We worked on uh, on it, and uh, actually, Andreas Berry, the singer from Death Star, was was supposed to sing on it. Oh, interesting. Is that uh, the is that the dude who was in Swordmaster? Exactly, and that's yeah. why he was sort of one of the guys because nice. he has a very similar voice to Johan, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. So, and uh, he's a really, really cool guy as well. So basically, Love we were at, after a while, we were in a, in a situation we had the full crown lineup except for the singer <laughs> and our brutal and death metal. So it's like, what are we going to do? <laughs> so, that's so, so that's funny. That Doomsday King then later on. Well, and it does uh, sound a bit different. Like it. So I, I will admit the Century Media Records. Uh, Doomsday King and uh, Death with De- Death is not dead. Is that is that it? Um, those are the ones I know the least. But I tried to prep myself a little bit by listening to some of it. Um, I didn't give it enough time. I really need it to sink in. But definitely Doomsday King didn't 
sound uh, the same. Um, but you know, I, I don't, I didn't take it anyway, one way or the other. And then you had uh, Jonas on that one. Is that is that right? And he's in at the gates playing guitar now. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, it's total in, inbreed here. In yeah, it's Sweden. funny. So well, good for him that he got that kick. Uh, but was okay. So was that something that he was so? So okay. So uh, your Death Star guy was supposed to do vocals, but how did how did Jonas get involved? Uh, we tried and tried with uh, Andreas, uh-huh. and uh, obviously Death Star has, uh, at least in Europe, just grown and grown all the time, and uh, so uh, we just couldn't make it work. Yeah, and uh, Andreas did. Uh, managed to write some uh, lyrics to I think at least two songs I think it was, but uh, but then when we realized we need to do it with someone else and uh, I actually asked Johan if he wanted to do it. Oh, cool! But, uh, at that point he was uh, uh, still a bit hurt that we quit after Possessed Thirteen and he uh-huh. had sort of started his one man army and yeah, was he court. was he doing that already or he was he just starting? Yeah, yeah he was doing it. Okay, and. Uh, uh, I think probably even working on the second album or something. Oh, gotcha. So he wasn't interested in sort of dropping one, uh, one man army and uh, uh, joining us. Gotcha. So, uh, so then discussion came up, who should we call? Mm-hmm. And uh, um, that was also uh, su- such a fanboy mo- moment because uh, I was just thinking, uh, who, who are the best singers? Like, yeah. You know, uh, who, who should we call? Should we call David Vincent or who, who the hell should we call? You know? <laughs> so, and there was always when we, uh, in our very young years, when we sort of partied every weekend, there was always this seven-inch single with a band called Utumno uh, that later on became Macabre End. Uh, okay. They had this seven-inch seven that I always played because I loved the vocals on it, and it was it was uh, brilliant. What year was that? What, what year did that come out? Oh, shit. must be 90 two or something like that oh, maybe cool. wow. very very early stuff um and uh, yeah so uh, i mentioned to the guys that do you remember that guy that i always used to play when we were kids you know i mean uh, amazing vocal uh, and uh, we were like is he still alive you know who is he <laughs> so <laughs> i tracked him down and called him up like yeah Jonas, hello big fan of your vocal style and <laughs> and he explained that yeah he's be, he's been working a lot with like progressive rock bands you know the, sort of different type the style of music sure. and, uh, so I told about the album that we had put together and basically just asked if that sounds interesting and uh, I think I sent him a song or two and he did a very simple recording home kitchen you know <laughs> and sent it back and it was like cool and i mean he's a really cool guy uh, well the, the downside was that he lives in stockholm and we live on the west coast so that, oh, okay. was, that was, it was all we were always used to you know being in the same city basically so right uh, uh, but we did that with jonas and then yeah a lot of shows and well not a lot of shows but quite many shows at least so uh it was the same thing there, uh, as you said earlier. That the plan was that Jonas is the new singer. It was right. never a plan. Uh, Jonas can come back, and this is the only album uh, we're trying to survive. But uh, that, that was the plan. You uh, that Jonas is the new singer, and then let's go forward. You know, that's and, interesting. Uh, you, you uh, sorry to interrupt you, but like uh, you know, talking about having where it's like you're, you're used to having the bands in the same city or something and obviously now where it's like you know the recording technology or whatever you can attribute to why it's so easy for bands essentially to you know put together albums anymore international acts yeah yeah uh where it's now just collectively i'm guilty of it too you know not being part of the cleveland scene and having a drummer in cincinnati or something like that so where you know and that's my local like kind of a uh you know just perspective of it that it's always interesting talking to somebody like you know the crown or whatever from sweden where you can be like talking about gothenburg and stockholm which were like you know far more up there as far as scenes yeah you know and the differences of it but i think that's kind of the point is that you know 
even within the same country, coast to coast difference, Gothenburg, Stockholm, there's a drastic difference. And so, you know, with, with that mention where it's like, yeah, you wanted to be in the same room, the same city, um, you know, obviously there's something to be had where that's what everybody kind of, when they love their old records is what they're citing that they love is the recording process that, hey, the band's all in or the same the writing, room. Yeah, we're, we're all writing. Same and, room, and, right? Yeah, exactly. So all the stuff that goes into it, and that's what makes me kind of curious, like, what are your thoughts on, like, now? Nowadays that, yeah, there are a bunch of people that can, you know, you could be in Chile right now and, and jam with a guy and put together a record. Like, do you think that that kind of has really diminished what scenes really were as far as, like, importance well, not, to sound and well, not stuff? Not even scenes, but just uh, the chemistry of, of yeah, being whatever. able to have but multiple even, people in a room to, to hash something out. Yeah, well, or if that's even what it is, like, I, I guess that's what the question is. Like, what do you think it is that even... A, I guess, is there an importance of scene to, you know, stylize something? And then, like, what do you think it is that it, that makes those things, uh, you know, what we hear? Yeah, I, I guess, guess yeah. Is, is this the end of scenes? Because that it's not, you can't really say maybe you're from an area anymore if you got all these guys from all over. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's a deep one. So <laughs> whatever you yeah. have to say to on that. <laughs> yeah, that is, that is really interesting because... Um, <clears throat> um, that might work for a lot of bands, you know, sending files and whatever, and in the end there's an album, you know? Yeah, for sure. So, uh, but it doesn't work for us, uh, because that we know because we tried it. And that's, um, the result of that is basically Doomsday King and Death is Not Dead. And uh, those are very, very different type of albums. Yeah. And, um, that is something, luckily, we, we realized um, when we did Cobra Speed Venom, we, we, we sort of realized that we can't do it, that I'm going to sit at home, track guitars by myself, and, you know, and right. whatever, you know. So uh, we, we decided for uh, uh, Cobra Speed Venom that, okay, we're going to be everybody in the studio, and uh, we're going to be there, hang like a fucking gang, you know, right. and uh, record around the clock, and whatever happens, happens, because we sort of realized that it's so important for the overall feel and production, because there's a lot of stupid 2 a.m. ideas that come up after. <laughs> yeah, beer, you know? yeah. I was just gonna say, yeah. It's like the the simple stuff that's like, you try that, and if you weren't there, to it wouldn't have happened. Or, well, cause sometimes it's even a fuck up, you know, like or especially vocals. Well, yeah, and you're like, oh, that's amazing. And you're like, yeah. Oh. Well, because yeah. there's a lot of like things you could do where it's like, if, you know, bo born to race. Or you could be like, born yeah. to race. You know, it's got a totally different effect. Yeah, so, right. And, and if you're not there to be like, hey, try that. Or what did you just do there? Yeah, do you that again. I mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. So maybe that's a lot yeah, of it. I, and that is that is for us very important because it, it, it is exactly like you said, because uh, we've never been sort of anal about that. You can't comment my guitar things or whatever. We always, you know, have ideas for everybody. You know, yeah. it doesn't matter. So uh, there can be like 2 a.m., Yo, when he's doing a vocal, and I had too many beers, and like, you like, do a fucking scream. <laughs> best part ever. I mean, that won't happen when you send files, and you know, right. no. work like. So for us, um, it's it's really important, and and that's uh, for me one of the key elements why uh, Cobra Speed Venom became so good. We rehearsed them as a band, and we went into the studio as a band, and, and, uh, and you can hear the difference. And I, I wasn't going to jump to that right away, but since since you're talking about it, um, those Century Media records, and I do kind of want to get back to how that happened. Uh, I did listen to an interview. I, I, was, I did, did do a little research. <laughs> a little we bit. do do our research here <laughs> at Into the Darkness and Reaper Metal Productions. But I did listen to a short interview with you, how you're saying you just wanted to try something different. You'd only really known Metal Blade, and obviously Black Sun was just kind of a startup. But um, was that it? You just When you when you had those, that record ready, you just shopped it around and see what kind of interest that you could bring? or how did that kind of come about? Yeah, it was, I think we talked with uh, four or five labels about it. And uh, I know I was one of those that sort of felt that, okay, if we're going to go into this again, are we going into this same or do we want to try something else? Sure. So uh, for me, that was very easy. Uh, and of course, you know, Metal Blade, Nuclear Blast, Centrimeter, those are the, you know, the big ones. Sure. Uh, so, uh, and uh, I knew some people working at Centrimeter as well, and there's actually one guy there that's turned out as our sort of uh, 
manager doing the the, the uh, shopping for the, the contracts and stuff like that. Okay. So, um, and uh, I, I really felt that we wanted to try something new. Yeah. You know, get to work with uh, some new people and see how they think about you know promotion and touring and uh, how they feel about us. You know, since um, of course they have a lot of high profile bands as well. So yeah. So I wanted to. And how do you stop? Something fresh, you know. Okay, it makes sense. But how did you feel now, uh, looking back? Like, how do you feel about the experiences where you can now? Comp- and obviously, you're back on Metal Blade, so there's something to be said there. Uh, maybe yeah. without saying it, but uh, what was the <laughs> you experience? Could say it. <laughs> you could say, it. yeah, you could say I it here. Hear it. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. So what? What was the experience? I mean, now that, that you were able to try something new, and and it looks like fortunately you, you only uh, contractually only had the two records, hopefully, and you didn't have to get bought out. But um, <laughs> Yeah, was Century Media? Were you just was the contract obligations over? Were you looking to like get the hell out? Uh, you know what uh, spawned? What was the tone of this deal? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I guess you don't have to tell us, but it is definitely no, interesting. No, 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 no. <laughs> Give it to us. I want, it, especially if it's dirty. Yeah. <laughs> we signed for uh, two albums. Uh, we did. Oh, that's so, cool. Uh, so, uh, but in a way, I feel really bad for Century Media because. Um, you know, we were back, and uh, we really wanted to do uh, good albums, but the circumstances were terrible for us. Yeah. Uh, well, like you said, you tried this uh, whole writing at home, and yeah, yeah, exactly. and especially for the Death Is Not Dead album, uh, I, I really like Doomsday King as an album. It's okay. different. It is different. But and uh, I mean, the the thrash riff ratio is unbelievable on that album. It's yeah. uh, it's focused on blast beat. It, everything is like two bits. So, but death is not dead was uh, a terrible experience due to a lot of circumstances. And I mean, it's really crazy that it ended up that I'm doing the drums for it. You know, you did the drums. I mean, yeah. Wow. I was going to ask about the drummer situation. Cause I didn't know if, if Yana, Yana came back just to record or if you programmed them or whatever. Cause Really, um, without having the record in front of you, nothing's really listed on it. So I was going to ask you about that. It's really we we didn't want to sort of super announce it because I know when we did the first video uh, for the Death Is Not Dead, uh, the Headhunter track. Mm-hmm. So uh, there's a drummer in there. So uh, I remember reading the comments on YouTube. It's like, yeah, good song, but where's the drummer? Where's the drummer? Where's the drummer? <laughs> So we really didn't want to announce it because for me it sounded stupid like, I don't know, from an established band, a guitarist comes up and does the drums. I mean, it doesn't sound professional. It sounds silly. <laughs> so that was the situation we were in that, because Jan moved to the U.S. Wow. And, uh, and, uh, uh, in the middle of rehearsing the album, basically, and uh, we really wanted to do it. And we were just thinking, how are we going to do this? And it yeah. was actually Jan that suggested that. Mark, I know you can play drums. Can you do it? I like oh, thought about it for a week or whatever, and, <laughs> and uh, but it it's a pretty terrible because it ended up that I played the drums on an electronic drum. Actually, this <laughs> drum kit. Oh, that's so funny. So played it and uh, yeah, tried to make it work and cheated on the double bass drums, <laughs> you know, and stuff right. like that. So, right. So, but afterwards, it became so obvious that um, we need an energetic drummer. Yeah. Uh, because for me, the Death Is Not Dead, it sounds tired. Uh, well, it just sounds flat, but in a different way than we talked about with Possessed 13. It just felt um, less energy or something. Uh, you know what I mean? And uh, yeah. maybe it has to do with that, but I, I do want to hear more about. Uh, where you were going when you were speaking of uh, when you felt like it needed a, more of a lively drummer. Yeah, it became obvious. Uh, I, I did my best uh, playing and I, me and Jan, uh, we were pretty synced how we think about drum parts and stuff like that. So that, that was maybe also one of the ideas that we thought, that, okay, maybe I should do it. Yeah. But what I lacked was the sort of uh, that, uh, that energy or whatever. Yeah. And uh, because I, uh, for me, it sounds really tired, and uh, there's also a lot of other details that m- create makes Death Is Not Dead so special. It's, it's also that um, we only managed to rehearse half the album. Half of the other album, we never even rehearsed. Okay. So uh, just played it, 
and actually first time I even used some of those amp simulators for the guitars and yeah. uh, so it became really if you compare to the old stuff it was like you know day and night right. how we do an album so uh well, isn't, it, isn't it funny like you can tell though like isn't it funny that like even with all the technology we have and that we could write an album right now or you could write an album right in that room and do everything and probably wouldn't know any different. But when you have something to compare to and the fact that yeah. you did it one way for so long that there's a striking difference. Yeah, um, exactly. it's, That's, it's do you really, really need, think you need a comparison though? I don't think you all even need well, a comparison I will, Well, I will say um, for the band Grave Plague that I have and uh, I sent to Marco, Yeah, most people don't recognize that I did everything on there that we programmed the drums because the drummer wasn't you know, uh, there's issues. We didn't have a drummer essentially that uh, was able to perform. Right. Um, that I don't think people. F- uh, the vibe I got was people think it's real. They think this and that, and we never comment on it because why would you? We, you know, we're just trying to write a record. But I did everything in my bedroom. So, yeah. but there's a vibe, and I tried. I I really tried to make it feel because I'm not a good guitar player uh, you know like marco said i'm only so good so the good part is maybe me not being so good i wasn't a super perfectionist and so it's a little looser it gave you the looseness. and i think that's the important part is you got to try to capture something that's real where you're not yeah. making it so perfect well may and that might be so i'm kind of curious then with you know your process then marco because like would you say Whatever it is that, you know, is the theme that we're describing that I, I, I call it probably organic, you know, human error or whatever, like the crown though. I mean, that stuff's really meticulously and really tight. Yeah, it is. And that is when you come to, cause it sounds like the drums are probably the, the fault of what the energy that you're saying it lacks that if it isn't like, you know, as precise, especially when things are extremely fast like that, a lot of that meticulously fast stuff, it'll lose energy in no time when it's not, you know, is all on the same you know page. Well, I want to cut into that, too, and, and just add to it before he responds is, uh, you know, Jana was su- such a good drummer um, and a different drummer from the Swedish drummers, which I think is important to note here because he was more extreme. You, you guys were like the extreme Swedish band. Uh because at that time, everyone was this kind of mid-paced. And obviously, like, <laughs> the ones that were more extreme, like, I was a big Soil Work fan. But they turned into almost a different band where you're, not, you're inviting these clean singing and inviting all this stuff. And not to say that that's terrible, but, right. you know, they kind of went in a more, uh, for lack of a better word, commercial or formulaic pop yeah. uh, direction where you guys never did. And Yana's drumming was always, like... It was like one of the fastest, especially on the tour I saw when you guys were opening for Cannibal Corpus and Christie. And it was like, holy shit, this dude's so fucking fast. It's so intense. And the fact that on like Death Race, it didn't sound uh, quantized or or fixed. There's some double bass that may have been a little sloppy here and there. And not not terribly sloppy, but just real. It just sounded real. And uh, Mm -hmm. so you're missing, I think, the character. So maybe the drums sounded like maybe to anyone else, the drums on uh, De- "Death But Not Dead" um, sound fine, and they don't really notice. But you lose character. There was like character loss because Yana was such a uh, interesting performer and player that the yeah. character was like dead. So yeah, maybe exactly. you know, it's not that you did a bad job or anything like that. Or I, I just think, yeah, yeah that, that lacked the crown character of like. Yana was always pushing. They were pushing, pushing, pushing forward. You know, it was like you were trying to keep up on guitar, you know, or something, you know. And and that yeah. that push and pull made made the band really, you know. Yeah. I agree. I totally agree. Uh, Yana was always pushing it. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, we all tried uh, to push it, and sometimes even over our capacity, you know. Yeah, that's <laughs> and, good you know, though. You know, very edge that you can actually manage to perform, you know, right. uh, and that becomes very interesting as well. And uh, Jan was also very technical, he enjoyed doing really strange stuff, you know. Yeah. Uh, he will learn to play, you know, by switching his hands, you know. Yeah. He could yeah. put in all the all the songs switching his hands. That's and awesome. That's so, um, so that was me, and uh, it became obvious when I tried to do it. Oh, no, no, you're good. It was, it was, it was, it was Facebook. I yeah, think. it was it was, so, it was so right. choppy there for a second. You know, I, I I wanted to ask you too. Like, oh, okay. Can I tell 
about uh, <clears throat> you were into that uh, also the energy part because yeah. uh, when when you today you know use these samples and all of that you uh, replace and whatever what, what you can hear in sort of the the real good drummers like Jan or whatever is you can hear that he actually hits hard right yeah but you can never hear that when you go in and yeah, you totally replace and you have the velocity on 127 all the time, you know exactly, what I mean? Exactly, yes. Yeah. But when you hear that a drummer hits hard being whatever, Tommy Lee or whatever, that's that, that gives also that extra energy, you know? Yeah, liveliness, yeah. Yeah, so that uh, more dynamic, yeah. when, you, when you hear him fucking pounding it, you know, you, you're feeling it. Right. Well, it's like setting a compressor, uh, you know, which is, you know, yeah. always kind of said this be in the audio world, like one of the trickier things that people can't always comprehend or, or just, I don't know, undermine or whatever that, you know, you, you can really do a lot when you're setting like an attack or something, which is essentially when your compressor is going to come in and smush things mm -hmm. down that even like on a drum or something like it can make it sound really aggressive um you know when you get it to that sweet spot it's going to just give it that nice little mush that you essentially you're taking volume and, and squishing it down to the rest of it that it's just you know if you got that nice little pop on it it's going to just be more when you you, you know you're limiting your audio or your uh your volume range for it and so obviously there's definitely something to, if that's going to be just something with sheer audio and a you know and a tool to get results out of it imagine yeah. the performance and how much more important that is right you know and, and drums are drums are so specific you know like there's so many things that go into them like if you're recording an acoustic drum you know you got to really concentrate especially in this digital age so if you're doing a bedroom recording to, uh <laughs> and this is what dude because i've done like a lot of you know production work with bands that'll do like their bedroom recording and then yeah. like dude i'm putting this out on vinyl and it's like dude you got to go back to your mix and fix your fucking drums because you got five different uh essentially the same recordings because you're surrounded by all these microphones, but right. the placement of them is what is causing your problems. All right. that stuff has to be, you know, pretty much sounding at the same time that wouldn't otherwise be an phase. issue. Phase it phases the, yeah. the, the term for it. And so if that's what just, you know, is sonically happening with physics and whatever, I mean, imagine that just as a performance standpoint. So yeah. hitting hard, all that stuff, drums, really important. And that's the biggest thing I think you uh, you hear lacking when uh you got like a drum machine and stuff yeah. like that's what you're trying to make up for yeah hell drum machines even come with that where like you can <laughs> hit the you know the the attack of it is, yeah. is essentially what it's called so i do want to commend you though marco as you said uh, about the compression it's yeah. um that compression compressor is the most common tool in yeah. our arsenal you right. know but it's for many it's it's very difficult to understand what it actually does so uh that that's the problem that you hear in these so-called bedroom recordings if they don't know the tools. I mean, they 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 they, they really don't know how to use it. Yeah. So that you get and, this old compressed stuff, you know. And so when it, to use it too, because yeah, yeah. you know, this, yeah, exactly. a lot of the same happens with a lot, especially audio gear. You know, a lot of those tools, they achieve. They're all giving different. Uh, sounds that would otherwise could be attributed to the non um, trained ear or just workmen <laughs> doing it to know like well hey if i use this compressor sure yeah it's going to do something into the equalizer of it that but maybe just using the equalizer would be better because you know there's i'm not going to go into whole audio stuff as i could easily do because i love chatting about it but you know what i mean that is it, like it's a very you you got to know when to use this stuff because that's where you can get crappy sounding records too but, but he, he's right people just throw a compressor on because they don't know and it's right. just a default factory preset on the compressor and they just think they need it and they don't even you know, know exactly what they're doing yeah yeah but but i do want to commend you marco on one thing <laughs> commend uh i actually really do love the paradise lost cover on death is not dead eternal so yeah i that's that's kind of the highlight for me to be honest yeah uh, that's yeah that's also cool because uh one thing for the death is not dead album is that when it was done. Um, we, uh, we were told to record a couple of bonus tracks. Okay. And that's actually when we brought in Henrik. Uh. So the, the tracks has Henrik on drums, and uh, the Paradise Lost track was intended to be a bonus track. Okay. 
but we moved that. So actually, that's the only track on the album that has real drums. So well, go that's figure. <laughs> See, got there the it good, is, got man. the good ear. Yeah. So yeah. So, so that's funny that it comes across. I was listening to that today, actually, on my drive in. I'm like, man, this cover is excellent. Like, because I was going through the rest of the record, and it, it was fine. Uh, but again, kind of falling f- funny, and uh, that came up, and I'm like, man, they really killed it with this fucking cover, man. They're like, <laughs> this is why is this like my favorite thing on this on this record? And see, this is why you got to go to the source sometimes. You know, <laughs> you, you, you've actually un- unveiled quite a bit that it makes sense why I like some of the stuff that I like, and that kind of brings me to, um, you know, I do want to talk about Cobra Speed. Well, fuck it, let's talk about Cobra Speed for a minute. So we're done with the records, and uh, I'm going to ask you a question, Marco. But uh, Cobra Speed, we, we talked about the it. The latest al- album. Yeah, Cobra Speed Venom. We talked about it a little bit off air as we had some technical issues, but... Um, <laughs> None. I wanted to applaud you on... Again, more applauding, but I wanted to uh, congratulate you on, on the sound that you were able to achieve because it does sound like rejuvenation. And there's some songs like... Um, oh, shit, I'm going to have to cheat. I'm, I'm terrible at the song names, man. Uh, let me pull it up. Like uh, Iron Crown, I was gonna say Iron Cross, Iron Crown, Destroyed by Madness. Those songs could have been on Death Race, you know. Like, I just feel like you could have went from Death Race to this record, and no one would have known the better. You know what I mean? It almost sounds like the continuation. And for me, that's great because Hell Is Here and Death Race are my favorite. But, uh, but I, yeah, again, it just it's an amazing return to form. And I think again, now learning about what you've been talking about for the last hour or so. Uh, that you're, you've gone back to the to the old ways. So if you want to talk more about that, since a lot of people didn't hear it because it was <laughs> off air, but uh, go ahead. Yeah, it is. Uh, as I said, one of, a lot of the reasons it, it became good and uh, sort of honest sounding and energetic and dynamic it is because it was it was done in a very short period of time and drums were done with like one one or two takes and we we didn't. We record guitars if there was a little minor fuck up or whatever. Everything was really quick done. So we we said to Friedrich that we we want that sort of punk edge to it. Uh, we don't, definitely don't want anything overproduced. So uh, that's why we did it pretty fast. And um, and it, it became so obvious when I started to make interviews that pe- that people hear it. That it's uh, <laughs> there's this, this energy and this sort of. Uh, rekindled something yeah it feels like i and i agree with you that it has it could have been the continuation from death race king yeah 100 uh, percent. and then so, you guys decided to go to uh frederick nordstrom right yeah exactly that's and, cool uh, yeah that was really cool uh, for many reasons but the the most simplest reason is that th- that is the studios that is closest to us. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's only, uh, Magnus lives in Gothenburg, but for me, he lives in Trollhättan, and it's only like a 50 minute drive there. So it's uh, really convenient. And obviously being a legendary producer and all of that, it's, uh, we knew that even if we would go in and have a short time frame, the end result would be professional. Right. So, and if it sounds rough or whatever, but it would be professional. Sure. Like, so uh, yeah. uh, sonically, so uh, and he's a cool guy to work with, and um, yeah, it's it, it's great. We're going there again. For next awesome, episode. that's awesome. Yeah, I wanted to ask you because obviously he was a sought after producer for a long time because of Slaughter of the Soul and even some other rec- you did the, the Dimu records and stuff like that mm-hmm. that uh, you know helped propel his name. But he's kind of been out of the limelight for some years with the uh, other guys that coming in, Sneep, and now even Sneep's kind of overused and. Or has been overused, really, and so some other guys, but uh, you know, like Jens uh, Borgen and, and those guys. But uh, you know, with Frederick, it's kind of cool because it's not like he got bad all of a sudden <laughs> yeah. at what he does. So it's cool to kind of see him. You know, and to be honest, I need to look up, uh, you know, what other records he's been doing over the last couple of years because I just honestly don't know. But it's cool to hear, yeah. man. It, he, he's still cranking out fantastic sounding records and, and it sounds again, honest. And so he's capturing you guys at your best. And I will commend him and you, and you, maybe I commend Henrik. I don't know on the drum sound on this record. Cause specifically I talked to Reaper about this on the way in, uh, the bass drum sound, it sounds very organic. It sounds super real. Um, I just really am a fan of, of the bass drum tone on this record. I don't really have more to say about that other than I, I really like it. So, I agree. 
I agree. And that was also something I talked with uh, Freddie uh, before we went into the studio. That we're going we're gonna to keep, we're going to use the drum kit that Henrik has. Yeah. Because that's how we sound. And uh, <clears throat> obviously he knows his ways with microphones and whatever. And uh, we got a really good sound. And this is really funny because I, I know before when we start planning the sessions and I told him that, uh, yeah, we recorded, I think it was 13 songs. And I said, yeah, Henrik needs top two days to do it. And we got to do it analog. So he was like, no, because we're going to, we're going to need to start editing kicks and stuff like that. No, no, he's super tight. <laughs> trust me. <laughs> analog. And um, because he's a fucking machine. Wow. So, uh, it is his playing that you actually hear. That's amazing. So, and where did you find amazing. him? Where did he come from all of a sudden? Like all of a sudden he's this like amazing talent that is underutilized. Yeah, it's uh, uh, I used to run a studio uh, and uh, he played in a band. What the fuck? What was it? It was oh, no. a, uh, a bit more than sounding thrash band. Uh, Implode, they were called. Implode, okay. They came, came into my studio and uh, we recorded, was it an EP or something like that? And uh, the first thing that struck me was, wow, this drummer, because he, he couldn't play wrong. It was, wow. it, was, it, was, it was amazing. So we sort of stayed in touch after that because sure. I also recorded another thing with him on drums. And <clears throat> actually later on when Angel Blake was supposed to play live, I called Henrik. So uh. the, so he joined in there for a show as well. So, uh, cool. so we st- sort of stayed stayed in touch. And when after the death is not dead, when we start talking about drummers, and I told the guys that not only is he fucking super good, he's he's a sweetheart. He's a he's a really good guy. Awesome. He's ten years younger than we, so it's good. He's a hungry drummer. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> hungry cheap drummer. Yeah. So, right. Uh, so, uh, now it's great. It's it's amazing. It's. Uh, Great guy to work with. That's awesome. I also wanted to comment on the cover art. I think the cover art's really stunning, and obviously there's a lot of bright and cool colors on this new record, and uh, uh, almost like elements of some old records, like almost Alter Madness, because of the faces and the wave, and like I don't know if that was intentional or, or um, I, you know, I'd love you f- to give you a, sh- I'd love for you to give a shout out to the artist uh, so people can check out more of the of the artist's work too. But maybe tell me a little bit about that, the inspiration for that and the direction. Yeah, you're actually correct. Uh, th- there's a lot of that Arthur's and Madness, Dan Seagrave feel to it because uh, something we discussed was that it's it's really annoying today because I mean all of us we're so used to the you know the the nice fucking paintings and artwork that you stared at for hours. And, right. you know, it's not happening today when you're looking at a Spotify icon. So it's, <laughs> it's really sort of annoying. So why are you paying $1,000 for someone to make an amazing detailed artwork, you know, and it ends up as an icon. So, but we, <laughs> but we knew that it's going to be released as an LP uh, vinyl and as a flag and stuff like that. So we wanted to go for the old school detailed stuff. Awesome. And, uh, the faces comes def- definitely from the Altos of Man and stuff. And uh, Christian Sloan, uh, the guy, uh, just an amazing guy. He, he went with it. He, he worked a lot. I mean, there's a cover that us old school fucks like that you can actually notice something new all the time when you yeah, look at it. Right. So uh, um, I remember at that time it was very popular to have very simple stuff like a black symbol or whatever on a red background or whatever <laughs> right so we went a bit more for the early 19s approach to it and um there's a lot of thought behind it with the wave and the what, sort of sense of time how it felt back then with the sort of uh how, how furious and venomous the the sort of uh information in the world was that a lot of uh, false stuff became truth, and it, it, I mean, I mean, like social media and stuff, and all that. Yeah, exactly. Social media and and whatever, all the Trump stuff or whatever. I mean, mm-hmm. a lot of bullshit became truth, you know. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so it was. So we sort of said that we need to try to capture that very vicious wave that is just sweeping, and you're defenseless, and uh, it's very venomous. So, uh, perfect. Yeah, we try to have 
an idea to it, a concept. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, it's cool to hear you explain it like that because it makes total sense. But I was just even in love with the visual because it is so striking. Uh, and those colors, yeah. you know, uh, again, like you said, everyone's kind of gone back to kind of these basic basic covers and, and whatnot and, uh, you know, all the bright colors and bringing out like a lot of what Dan Seagrave kind of used to do with, with death metal covers. pretty amazing. Well, there was a lot said there just mean when he's saying, yeah, yeah, for the Spotify thing. The like, icon, yeah. Well, because I've been there too. Like, yeah, you get your cover art and you're blown away and then you start really diving into everything that's going to be the, you know, once you get your artwork, then you got to start putting it all together for whatever the heck. So like, you know, dicking around with the logo placement stuff because then you take into consideration like, all right, well, it looks great, blown up. It's the, the LP is going to be beautiful. But then you shrink it down. You're like, shit, I, what the f- I don't even know what that Can't is. Can't even see it, yeah. Yeah, and you got to take that consideration because worse than the LP, that's going to be the one that people see most. Right. You know, so you really got to take in consideration the digital world and, and how things look because yeah. we've made that shift. And, you know, I don't know. It seems to work with all the other older records, but when it came to mine, I was found <laughs> ones that are like, damn it, that looks like shit. You know, when it's <laughs> microscopic, maybe it's just, you know, you're criticizing your own work. I'd like to think, you know. Right. <laughs> Because that would be really fucked. <laughs> well, his worked out. I mean, the crowns worked out well because I think even as a small icon, the colors are so yeah. uh, stark that uh, it really grabs your attention one way or the other. You know. Yeah, you're laying a lot into the the cover art, and and the funny thing is, is um, a, I didn't even know you're gonna bring it up, and so I like, it just kind of looked. Because I'm a little more like I, I you know, I, I'm a little less of the aware fan as you are than you are. Yeah. And so, like, uh, it strikes me not knowing, like, you know, this is where they stopped for a moment or sure. whatever. When I see that, it just it fits right in. Yeah. It almost seems like, oh, oh, that's where that would be. Like, that was almost like, oh, it, oh, that's the new one. Hop, like, I would have thought that would have been the old. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So that's kind of, um, I guess part of what you're describing then yeah that it, so it works out very well uh, with that totally and now i'd like to challenge you and uh i know it's the difficult thing to do to uh kind of analyze yourself but there's actually a really cool and i'll shout out to decibel magazine they had a uh they do an article it's kind of reoccurring they've done it with a few different artists what's called rank in defile and i read one with paradise lost and gregor specifically who's actually been a guest on Into the Darkness, uh, my original incarnation, just oh. the podcast version. Previous. Uh, yeah, in like 2015, I, I got to speak with Gregor at, at length, so that was really cool. And we had toured with uh, some um, mutual friends and acquaintances, so even after the interview, we chatted for a while on a personal level, so that was really cool, because uh, like yourself, Marco, and we can go into this too if you want, uh, I'm a huge Paradise Lost fan, it's probably one of my favorite bands of, uh, of all time, at least in the metal world, for sure. And uh, Gregor's been a huge influence on me, uh, even even the stuff he's done in Val and Fire and kind of his spirit. I, I just like, I vibe with it, you know. Um, so anyway, I would like to get into you kind of ranking your albums. Let's start at the your least favorite to the favorite. And I'm, I'm thinking by everything that we heard, we can kind of guess where it's going to start. But, uh, you know, I'd love to get your take on it and, and kind of explain, even just in a short sentence or two, why kind of you're placing it there. Um, because a lot of people... Again, from a fan perspective, I would have a totally different list in most cases, but it's also because I have a different experience with those recordings and those albums because of when I heard them. And uh, I'm sure we would all have a different take on it, but hearing it from the artist is interesting because you kind of have the inside scoop of what happened and how it affected you or the lasting memory uh, that that stays with you. So uh, if you don't mind kind of going through them, I'd love to hear it. Sure. Uh, yeah, not a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Death is Not Dead. Yeah. It's, a, it's a difficult album for me. And uh, it's like you said, I mean, I've heard from people saying like, yeah, it's a really good album. But I, I just, I just for me, I just get this flashback as a lot of issues and problems and challenges and all of that. So uh, for me, it becomes a bit uh, difficult. Sure. So, uh, so, uh yeah, that's that's the worst one. Okay, I mean, and then next from there, a couple of good songs on there, yeah. but uh, and we when we play them live, you know, it has that extra ten BPM and whatever energy, <laughs> and uh, they become really good. So, uh, uh, but yeah, it's there. You go, it's album dumb. album to re-record in the future with a real drummer. There you go, <laughs> ten BPM fast. <laughs> no, you're not allowed to. <laughs> you don't want to piss off the drummer. I didn't hear what did Marco say. I didn't hear. No, it also has our worst cover artwork, in my opinion. Yeah, the pinball thing. I, I, yeah, where, where did that come from? 
I don't know. I I, I really don't know. Uh, <laughs> There's nothing wrong with it, like how it's done, but right. it's nothing that we should have accepted as a cover, in my opinion. It was confusing, and uh, yeah, I meant to ask you about it anyway to, to shed some light on that. But uh, who, whose decision was that at the end of the day? Obviously, it's very well done. If you look at it from a technical yeah. perspective, I mean, it, it, it looks good. But uh, yeah, I didn't seem to get the, uh, the the pinball thing. I thought maybe, I don't know, the whole retro kind of yeah. element you guys incorporate into your sound maybe it had something to do with it but uh yeah i don't know Any, anything to shed on that uh, i don't know if it was a desperate decision or whatever i i really don't remember i know that there wasn't a a, a concept or a, a deeper idea at least what i can remember uh as i said uh, like technically it's it's well done but and it could suit great to another band but for us it, it's uh, I don't th- think it captures uh, what we're about. I know. <clears throat> okay, cool. Well, it's good to, good to at least get your take on it for sure. Yeah, I, I was always confused about that too. And maybe that's part of like the disconnect with that album altogether is, you know, the combination of how you wrote it, the feeling of it, and then the artwork just kind of matches the confusion, you know? The artwork doesn't help. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. All right, well, moving on, what would be kind of the second least favorite there if you're moving through your catalog? Well, if we can include the re-recording ones, uh, ah, sure. I think I will go Crown on Holy there. Okay. Uh, it's, uh, as I said, it's it's at least as good as Crown and Terror, but it's just the whole feel to it, to sort of why the fuck did we do it? And... Uh, yeah, this this overall experience about the whole uh, re-recording that for me doesn't really feel excellent. So uh, yeah, I will go with that. Okay. <clears throat> Continue on. <laughs> right, uh, we got a lot of them. Let's go with the burning. <clears throat> I wouldn't uh-huh. say it's terrible either, but it, it's. Uh, I mean, I can't listen to the songs because those are songs from you know from the demo days to. I mean, they're they're. they're I know them by heart, back and forward, so uh, I'm so sick of them. But uh, um, pretty cool songs, but I would rank it as the third worst one, okay. in my opinion. Yeah. And uh, then I would say Possess 13, actually. Ah. It's uh, um, just for the, as we discussed earlier, that it may sound a bit flat or whatever. Uh, a bit different feel to it, and uh, um, <clears throat> but on that one, that's probably one of our coolest artwork there, in my that, opinion. That is a cool one. Yeah, maybe you look up Possessed Thirteen, uh, Mister uh, Host Producer. <laughs> yeah, everything today. But yeah, look yeah, that one up because I actually I, I do like it. I don't know if it completely fits my, like my idea of the crown i don't even know what that means but um but i do really like the artwork for that and, and it makes you want it makes me want the album to to it makes me want to like it more um yeah. but yeah it, it's got this almost like old horror movie vibe um yeah, yeah. it's really cool and was there obviously the, the the whole name possessed 13 like i guess you can kind of insinuate where that's going but but is there something behind the name of that record in the in the artwork specifically that you, you that would be cool or interesting story i know that when we wrote the songs we didn't intend them to be uh, or to have any sort of horror theme or anything but i know that when <clears throat> uh, the guys that did the artwork presented the cover artwork that's when we try to add some horror elements to it, maybe with the intro on the album. And right. there's this song I wrote that is in the middle of the album. There's a lot of sound effects and stuff like that. So uh, this instrumental song, what's it called? Dream Bloody Hell. That sounds okay. like a horror movie. Yeah, so, right. Uh, so, uh, and yeah, some details like that. And I think even the songs we divided into sort of like three chapters and we named them like something like cinematic, uh, like three different sets, you know, or what do you call it, scores, or what? what is the word? Uh, like chapters, so, uh, almost. Like, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Like in theater, there's always three yeah. acts. Yeah, acts, yeah, there you go. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and that was also the first time we changed our logo. Right. Uh, and, uh, we pretty much ripped off the old, you remember that Thrasher magazine? Yeah, yeah. Or if you if you if you go back and look at that logo on the magazine and look at the logo on Possessed Thirteen, that's the same vibe there. So uh, 
uh, also we added the, the return of the crown. Right. Of Why is right. it? What's the Made name? Made it more cinematic afterwards, but uh, that was that wasn't the plan from the start. But uh, the artwork was so amazing, and they did a white version and a black version as well. So, uh, and uh, we printed on, on normal paper, not on this glossy paper stuff. So, uh, right. So, uh, yeah, that was our first sort of money put into the sort of uh, artwork production thing in a proper way yeah why why the name possess 13 like because if you're going the horror route maybe like you know like old school movies like so like dementia 13 comes to mind mm -hmm. and stuff like that or is there just 13 songs and you were going to call it possess so let's throw the 13 on there <laughs> yeah well i think i think it was very simple in the end i mean uh possessed obviously being a sort of horror word and yeah. 13 being like number or something so uh it sounded Sounded cool. <laughs> There's not a song on the album that is called Possess 13, so it's just for the title. So uh, back then it made absolute perfect sense. <laughs> <laughs> I think it makes sense yeah. in the end. It, it stands out, at least it caught my eye, maybe because I'm a horror fan, but uh, I, I mean, it doesn't suck. <laughs> As Tommy's been saying, it's, just, well, I didn't it's been the so most great. candid interview. Yeah, you said there's a lot of the <laughs> like, that album sucked. It was like, well, geez. <laughs> I don't recall. I don't recall. Going that. into the darkness for real. Yeah, right. <laughs> All right. Well, let's continue on. All right. Next up, uh, Doomsday King. Uh, also, uh, various reasons that is sort of different feel to it. And uh, one very interesting detail why this end up sounding very different is that we never rehearsed a single song. Uh -huh. uh, this is really scary. And uh, <laughs> because. This was the Doberman project that I talked about, right. uh, and Magnus wrote the, the 10 songs, and he basically sent a click track to Janne when he plays sloppy guitar, because he can't even palm mute, so it was like, <laughs> and, and he had a narrative track also talked, yeah, here would be cool with some, uh, uh, whatever. Oh, interesting. And uh, here we could have a drum roll and whatever, Yeah. and then Jan just went with it, and it's also actually recorded on electric drums, and that you can really hear. It, that it sounds uh, oversampled. Yes, yeah, it's, it it's a weird sounding record for sure. It, it, for you really, guys, it's really weird sounding in many ways. So Janne recorded at home <clears throat> uh, all the drums, and when ja uh, Magnus asked, asked me, "Do you want to be the guitarist?" and yeah. so <laughs> we took that. That was the time I had my own studio, so. I basically sat down riff by riff. Magnus told me, and I recorded the riffs. It's like, how does the first riff go? Oh, do, 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 do. <laughs> next riff. <laughs> it's also really cool to listen to this album because I don't know it. Uh, <laughs> it's not a band because I, I can't remember the riffs and uh, arrangements and stuff like that. So it's it's a really weird album in many ways. Yeah. So, but it's it's kind of funny that you mention all that. Uh, no one would obviously ever know the difference. So it's cool to hear the story, and it really reminds me. And we've mentioned Testament already um, for re-recording an album, but you almost followed another Testament trend because Testament was going to break up at one point and be called Dog Face Gods, and that was the demonic album, right? And so it's kind of a similar story. With Doberman, so it's really a whole different project. But you guys just all said, "Ah, let's uh, yeah. hey, you want to play on it? Okay." And it and just became the crown again. Go ahead. Bands, both bands that established themselves as a name and then changed their names because the Testament was oh, the, the legacy. The legacy. Yeah, I mean, I'm obviously. just saying, it's just yeah. a small detail yeah. that still falls. Yeah, kind of similar, really. I mean, yeah, so, yeah. You guys have a very. Uh, I don't know if you ever paralleled yourself to Testament before, but we're finding a lot of similarities here. I don't recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> I love Testament. He, this guy is a different story. But. Me too. Yeah, I like him. Me too. Yeah. And then let's go to Crowning Terror. Now we're getting to the what are we top five or something. Yeah, like the that. juicy stuff. Yeah. I like it. It's good. It's uh, yeah, it has it's all the elements uh, that we like to have in an album. It's the mid-tempo stuff, melodic stuff, fast stuff, whatever. It's uh, we all the good elements there and uh, very good lyrics, co-written by Magnus and Tompa. Uh, so uh, and, and Tompa writes good lyrics generally, yeah, anyway. Yeah, and that's basically why I because I've been following at the gates when they were called grotesque. You know, right? They're really. Old. Stuff. And when At The Gates released The Red and Sky Sours, I always liked that Tompa never wrote about, you know, uh, hell and killing and, you know, yeah. demons. And it was always a bit more poetic, if you know you know what I mean. Right. So uh, I always enjoyed that part. And uh, 
Uh, obviously, we can't go full poetic with Crown, but there are some elements in there in his, how, how we, he's a pretty smart guy and he's, he has a good way with words and phrases. And, uh, and yeah, I like that album. It's, it's, it's really cool. I do too. And, and I, did, I did feel like it was the, the next step after Death Race. I, I do feel like, uh, you know, that fit really well. I know we talked about Cobra. Cobra Speed could have maybe even filled that slot, but I, I think. Even if Cobra Speed came after Crown and Terror, I think it would have been a fit. I think it, it all kind of stays in line with, with who the band is and your unique sound. Um, obviously, you went yeah. through some ups and downs and some strange times, and it's well documented now because all of those are records. But I think that's the important thing about having a history and having a recorded history like you. That's what makes it so interesting is that you, you know, not every record can be a Death Race King or not every record can be a Beatles White Album or a Master of Puppets, rather, for our audience or Rain and Blood, right? Um, it, it's just what it is. So I, I think it uh, it helps tell your story, which to me is just even more interesting. You know, you have to have, let, let's call them failures, right? You have to have the failures to really appreciate the, yeah. the successes, you know? Absolutely. All right. So we are in the top four now. Yeah. Uh, which right. <laughs> this conversation needs to take a little bit of a turn. I'm, I'm a curious. Of, uh, well, I'm curious to see where he goes from here on out. Because yeah, uh, yeah, because these are all kind of my favorites too. So. All right. So Henley's here. Mm. Uh, in the, I love everything about it except the production. I can't stand the production. It's terrible in so many ways. I understand a lot of people say, "Oh, it's so unique," but no, it sounds terrible. It's, that's that's my take on it. Well, but it's... I love. It. Yeah. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Finish. I, I could. I could chime in after. Uh, I love the songs, and this was definitely the album when we started messing around with the punk and rock and roll ideas yeah. and the song. I mean, simple rock riffs that we just added blast beat to it. I mean, it became something really different, really yes. weird, you know. And uh, also, always trying to pay attention to have a chorus and have a sort of bridge and, you know, the array, very classic rock structure in there. Say that again one more time, Marco. We, uh, so, uh, Facebook is cutting out. We, we still got... Uh, uh, we still got audio and uh, video on our side. It's just Facebook being weird. I like it a lot. And uh, the songs, you arrange them as a classical rock song which, where you have the verse, bridge, chorus, and then you have the lead and you end up with a double chorus or whatever. So uh, that structure was really cool and maybe a bit unique uh, being a fucking death punk band. So uh, right. I enjoyed that a lot. Well, I think it I think it really stands out as a turning point where you guys really yeah. started to find your sound. And, and to be, uh, I want to bring Reaper in on this one because I think this is the record that would really appeal to the Reaper metal fans, the Hell's Headbangers fans, because um, this is the record yeah. where they did start blending all this. And, and he, it's funny, you mentioned the production bothering you so much, but this is the production that like everyone's striving for <laughs> today is kind of this <laughs> shitty old school sound. You guys... It was probably just this is what you could afford. This is the guy you're using, and this is we did the best we could at the time, uh, which yeah. is how it should be, um, rather than trying to imitate or create well, something I think artificial. Com- I think that conversation, that element, is, is always the case, you know, and, and that's why I think it's kind of annoying. I, actually, you know, I'm kind of curious too, which Marco, your input would be, you know, being a producer and stuff, and that. You know, because I got this, I got this thought that's like, yeah, because everybody it, it is, they're they're looking for like that old school approach and stuff, and it's so much that it's it's the umlauts, you know, yeah. same mentality of it. It's annoying, <laughs> and nobody like fully exploits the idea behind that. That it's like, you know, I, I think it'd be awesome that I think '80s demos have a particular sound to them. It's always bass heavy. And lots of verb, everything's wet. Yeah, yeah. Uh, or or not. It's really up in front, you yeah, know. But it's always that there. bass heavy. There, there's a lot of that rhythm section, and 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 through bass, I think comes ugliness. Uh, I always had this thought in my head that you know, uh, with this old school thought mentality of like make things ugly, especially in a death metal world. Like, why aren't more bands focused on that kind of mix and that kind of sound where everybody's like, they just got their mess of boogie guitars and like, don't seem to 
uh, battle the the reality that's like right in front of them. That's like it just seems like the reason why we got trigger drums and the tinky tangy that sounds that follow and make me hate drum sounds of of the like is because of everybody having just all this bottom end. Once once guitar went bottom end, bottom end, then the bass was just fucked. And then now when you like want to bring all that back, there's just too much in that range, and, and that's at least why we get that sound. But like nobody then went back to you know recraft that mold. Like guitars are essentially, especially going back to that rock and roll element. There, you listen to a rock and roll record, man. The guitar is thin as hell. Right. You know, it's all about the bass. All that bottom end, anything heavy about a rock album is from the bass. When they're doing different things, and too, they're and doing different important. things, right. and so it's like I, I nobody ever seems <clears throat> to to try to do that and then apply that '80s demo sound to it, but a little bit more produced and and you know uh, crafted around yeah. it, like. It all just seems to turn into an overproduced piece of shit that somebody says, we really have some old school elements. It's like, I don't hear them. Like, it, it <laughs> right. might have been in there in your head, but I don't hear it. Like, yeah, I want to hear right. something that literally translates that. And it only seems to be uh, underground stuff doing the same umlaut, you know, esque production, yeah. you know, that, uh, you know, I'm not going to sit here and try to describe. So I, I'm just kind of curious uh, as a producer too yourself that, that obviously has that thought and then has applied that even songwriting stuff to something that we've obviously noticed. Like, what are your thoughts to that? Yeah, it's really interesting because I've talked to bands and they maybe have an idea how they want to sound and that sound they want to replicate is something from like 1982 and what they have, have they have top modern gear. Right, know? right, yeah. And it was like one band I talked with, they was like, yeah, we want to sound like a shitty Dark Throne uh, recording. <laughs> so I was like, you come to me, why don't you buy a $10 tape machine and record it more? <laughs> exactly. So, so it doesn't make sense. So, uh, so, so I, I, get, I can get asked to sort of polish something into, but the sort of, yeah, it's, it, they should have done completely differently from the start, you exactly. know? Exactly. Buy a fucking shitty amp or, you know, and uh, have a bit untuned guitar or whatever, you know. Yeah. So, but don't come to me with clicky drums and everything is super tight and ask it to sound like Scream Bloody Gore or something, you know. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the point. It's the imitation versus the being honest about it. And if they're honest about it, they would have this shitty gear and they would get the tape deck and hit record. And, you know, but they're coming to you who's actually like trying to do a good job and make them sound, you know, like them. And uh, yeah, they have all this great gear and you're like, but but imagine the guy that can do a good job then maybe not even go and get yet yeah, i mean maybe you would like get a, a four track or something like but i guess what i'm trying to say is like you can still even do a good job and try to do that old school stuff but nobody's trying to do the good job it's like the good job needs to come out of there and it's just like no we've heard do a shit job on purpose right. and that's why it's lost in the translation because it is what you just said that's what they had it was of the time right i'm saying like embrace the fact that we're beyond this we know the metal mold do a good job but go grab a four track and a cassette deck to record the bass so it's ugly as fuck yeah. and then do the rest in pro tools because you're gonna have to essentially at least. Get yeah creative you'd be it. tied down to the four track at that point but uh Again, I want to applaud the crown. I'm, there's a lot of you applauding. Don't applaud, man, you might be on the point of blow at this point. <laughs> oh, I, let's not go there. The bass, the bass has always been a prominent feature, and maybe it's because Magnus writes half of it with you. I, I don't know what it is. I've seen you guys live a couple times, so uh, and he's a presence on stage as well. He kind of carries that rock and roll. Uh, gusto, for lack of a better word, even with his hair how it used to be, just a fucking mess. And you know, I mean, he he looked like he lived the rock and roll lifestyle, brother. Like, I'm living in a van outside. I don't give a shit about anything. I'm gonna get fucked up tonight. Yeah, and I'm gonna fuck your wife and whatever it is that he looked the part. Let me tell you that. I agree, I agree man. <laughs> it's like a combination of. Uh, <clears throat> Someone from Ramones and Nikki Six and a bit of David Vincent, and it's all punked up. <laughs> yeah, totally turned up to eleven. Yeah. yeah, and the sound was there too. So not only did he have the look, but you could play, and he had the tone, and it carried yeah. through your records. Which I, you know, kind of getting back to what Reaper saying is the whole point of this is it, it was yeah. ugly, and it was the way it should be. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree, and uh, we we noticed that very early on. He hits very hard. Yeah, you know. Uh, <clears throat> you don't need to over distort it because the, he, he ends up in a good distortion level due to he hits so hard, you know. Yeah. So, uh, 
Um, there's a really good bass sounds on our albums, and I know for Possess 13, he used a, I think it was a Rickenbacker or something, and we sort of noticed that it sounded really cool, so it's very loud in the mix as well. Yeah. So I think every, also in the Cobra Speed Venom stuff, it's it's very it's very present. Sure. So totally. It's 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 very common in in death metal that uh, the low end comes from the guitars only, and you know, it, bass is just. <laughs> The very very sub bass totally exactly. Uh, exactly. The bass has a lot of high mid as well. So, right. Uh, I mean, right. So if you push that forward, it, it also gives uh, another sense of uh, energy. So it's uh, completely. Yeah. Uh, because I, I, I got this theory about that too of why no one will do everything I just blabbed is like because it's almost like yeah because they all all these bands now they come in there with their messy boogie guitars and they're they're so bass heavy then the bass player's sitting in the corner going like fuck. Then the drummer's like, you know, because they, they're in the studio and they hear these back, and then the drummer's like, God damn it, now I can't hear my kicks. And then the guitar players just say, it's got to be more and more. <laughs> so then the, the, and then the engineer the whole time, he's just like, no, no, no. And then by the point where it's just like, well, I can't hear the kick drum. And it's like, you know what, then fuck it. I'm not even going to tell you what you need to do, and that's get rid of most of this bass and your stupid fucking guitars because they're not supposed to be gar- – they're tribal instruments, damn it. Just leave it. We'll, we'll just make them tiggy taking drums. And yeah. that's what we got. Well, and then, then now everybody's and then you, molding that stupid fucking mold. Then you have like, this like uh, frequencies on top of each other and, and it, you know, obviously taking away from yeah each instrument because this is on top of this and this is on top of that and then it just becomes a fucking nightmare. Yes, because it's not being mold- nerdy saying this shit. This is literally how it works. Yeah, this, this is, is how literally it works. what you do when you're Pay doing this stuff. Pay attention to your yeah. craft. Pay attention I to what mean, the fuck you're doing. That's all it is, really. You can yeah. sound as shitty I'll- as you want it, but like, <laughs> there's a reason you know people have been doing it the same way for fucking what, right you know, and, and, and i think some of those years, answers to recraft something rather than always be the fucking clone production yeah are, are, in, are in this what i'm describing yeah. and nobody's trying that challenge it's just no make me sound like this and and it's probably and it's a lot of like what uh, marco just even said too when, when you're when you're focused on being cloning something, it's not like what he said. You know, when he's describing you know how the bass and and, and it's much of the character of the musician too. You're not focused on the musician because you're trying to clone fucking Morbid Angel at that point. You know, yeah. So <laughs> that's that's really interesting because that comes very obvious, especially <clears throat> let's say maybe younger bands that decide to record everything at home uh, because they m- maybe don't have. The full skill of the, you know, uh, frequency separations and stuff yeah, like yeah. that, and yeah, even the tools as compressors or what. So that that was something I because as I said, I used to have a full full on recording studio, but a year ago I only started like a, a mixing studio. Yeah, and that sort of my attention. Of, Please record at home. It's fantastic. It's cheap and everything. <laughs> right. But if you need a bit of bit of professional help in the end i can help you you know with the final mix so we can separate shit and stuff right. like that and, you know have an even flow to it so uh today it's very obvious when it's recorded at home by people that really don't know what the fuck they're doing right yeah because the tools that uh, and like the ability to do it at home could be very powerful but if you don't sure. have the fundamentals of what you're doing to know that you know, hey, you want to put like a low pass on that guitar or something yeah. so you can let that bass come through, then yeah, you're just gonna. It doesn't mean shit. It's not gonna mean yeah, shit. You're right. and so, but I'm, you know, what I mean, like I, I, I can assure you, you know, Marco could sit there and take somebody's recording and literally work, probably do it in a shitty room and get way better results because you know what you're doing. Yeah. As opposed to the band that's just gonna keep going over and over in circles because they just don't know what they're fucking doing and then they won't well, compensate dude, I, their I've, bass. <laughs> I don't want to totally get on the sidebar because I still want him to finish this list, but yeah, audio uh, nerdery. It would be cool to actually have a like audio nerd think tank eventually because there's obviously a lot of guests we could bring on. Um, one in particular that we've been talking about that hopefully will happen. Yeah. But um, Mark would be a great person to have on it too. But you know, I've watched you, I've witnessed you during the mastering phase, well, mixing and mastering phase of some bands you worked with, which are obviously maybe a little more smaller, from, maybe from a different country even, and they're trying to explain to you what they want and you're like, this sounds like fucking shit. I'm just trying to give you like a decent mix here and you're telling me to do the opposite, but I don't have it in me to do the opposite because it's fucking terrible and my name's on it too, motherfucker. So, you yeah. know, you have that struggle too. If you're like, they're going to be judging me on this and at the end of the day, they're the client and it is what it is. But, you know, you, you want to like at least give them the 
Oh, you're yeah. just trying to do a good job. I yeah. mean, and this guy, this guy's telling you not to do a good job. Dude, I'm telling you, it's why the producers in those. That, hey, there's always that. There's. I guarantee you, there's that producer going like, I know that sounds like shit, but I just want these fucking guys out of here. Because <laughs> <laughs> there was like a joke on like the Onion or whatever those sites are called, where they do these, you mm-hmm. know, thing. And there was like, you know, some band, and it was like, you know, they go to the producer and like, you know, he said that the drums sound horrible. So I did nothing. Then the guitar player came over back out to that mix and said, I want to hear my guitars louder. So I did nothing. Then the vocalist said that was a problem. So I did nothing. And then they all heard the finished result and they all loved it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's fucking true, dude. How many bands do you know that are like, we're still toying with the mix for three years? Wow. Okay. Well, <laughs> yeah. you won't be fucking Marco looking back at that record and at least just being like, I didn't, I mean, whatever. It didn't work out. I didn't like it. But at right. least you got it done. You yeah, know, like exactly. fuck, move on with your life because those cause they treat those like the only songs they can write. Right. You know. So anyway, well, speaking of moving on, memory. so we, we the hell is here kind of took us down this path. I love the record. <laughs> I love it for what it is. It's a moment in time. Uh, but but it, again, it's cool to like hear your perspective. So let's yeah. get to the what we have the final three now. All right, top three: Eternal Death. Ah, nice. It's one of my favorites as well. It's a very difficult album if you haven't heard it when it sort of came came out or whatever. Right. right. Uh, it has a very special feel to it. We were heavily inspired by the, by the typical Swedish, uh, what do you call it, black death metal, you know, unanimated dissection, all, all of that, you know, very melodic. There's always a rhythm and there's a mel- melody on it and uh, very ambitious arrangements and... Um, this long lyrics and uh, I just think it has a feel that is very fucking evil in a way. Yeah, I think it's uh, um, there's some really good songs there. Uh, production wise, very special to say the least. Um, it there's not a not a lot of low end there. It's uh, all about the mids and uh, <laughs> but I like it. I like it. It's 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 really cool. But as I said, if you heard us for the first time with the, I don't know. Cobra Speed Venom or something, it can be a very difficult album to understand, but right. uh, like late 90s, it, it make, made absolutely perfect sense. I, I, I really like it. Yeah, it's very ambitious. period, for sure. Yeah, completely. And, and again, it was kind of you guys finding yourself and a lot more black metal leanings on there. Uh, but you started that blending. It was a little more disjointed. Um, yeah. They weren't as blended, let's say, as it became. Yeah. But... Um, but again, a step in the in, in the direction you guys ended up going in, and a uh, really important one for me. I, I do have the burning and like it, but uh, this was kind of that next progression. And like you said, there's something about uh, maybe the timing of it when I heard it in the late '90s, the the sound of it that does give you more of that kind of dissectiony vibe, where uh, it does sound kind of very dark and and uh, yeah, it's just it's a special record for me too. Yeah, well, you're in the cool. top two now. Yeah, top two. Cobra Speed Venom. I think it uh, deserves to be up there. Yeah. And uh, I would almost tie it up with the only album that is left on the list, <laughs> Death Race King. <laughs> I think uh, for me, uh, we talked about it before, but I, I think in a sense they they could have easily belonged together sure. as an after Death Race King. So, But Cobra Speed Venom, yes, uh, super proud of it. And uh, for us and for a lot of fans, it felt felt like a sort of comeback in many ways yeah because uh, yeah as we talked uh, they, they felt the energy again the sort of will to play and uh, you know sound furious you know uh, right. energy so uh, i think it's really cool so yeah so number one death race king i yeah. think it's uh, we nailed that motherfucker it's it has everything that needs to be on a crown album and coming from hell is here where we almost went over the top with some ideas it it just ended up being a perfect balance of the rocker blitzkrieg witchcrafts to the death explosions and whatever <laughs> right know. right so, so i think i think it's perfect i i i really like it i and it, i probably have selective memory but i only have good memories about that <laughs> whole session that's awesome so, yeah and what about the art for that record we, we actually didn't touch on that um who was yeah. the artist on, on Death Race? Or what was kind of the, uh, if you can give me any insight on the on the name of the record and then how the artwork tied in and anything, that would be kind of cool to, to learn. Yeah, sure. 
it's um, <clears throat> it actually goes back to at the gates, um, or at, was it the first at the gates or first at the gates EP? They had a member called uh, Alf Svensson. Yeah. So uh, there was a guy there called Alp Svensson. I know he played in ber very early on in At The Gates, but then he quit and started a tattoo studio. So uh, he was a well-known well tattoo artist in Gothenburg, and um, Magnus was at his studio and basically went through the sheets looking for cool artwork. And uh, that artwork is from one of his sort of portfolios that he had in the tattoo studio. So uh, we liked it, and we bought it, and uh, we just thought it was really cool. And, uh, you know, going from those very colorful previous albums, right. especially Hell is Here with the, all the burning hand and, you know, going the orange-red theme, which is always super metal, but we, <laughs> you know, you, next time you want to do something opposite. Right. So uh, this is really simple, and the, I think the first edition of the album I think it's printed on the actual sort of jewel case, and it was a, sort of like a silver printing or mm -hmm. something like that. So it was really cool. And um, uh, actually, the, <laughs> the font to the title, Death Race King, if I recall right, it's from a uh, Magnus saw a hockey stick. That was, a, was a, the brand of the hockey stick was from a, uh. you know, the, so it's, it looked like something very action-like, you know, some fast. <laughs> so, uh, I believe we found that font, and that's what we use for the Death Race King. Yeah, and, uh, I mean, looking at it now, it looks pretty cheesy, but I mean, I totally yeah. understand. And then I, I guess I don't get the, like, oh, I get that it's in, uh, like a, a pentagram, uh, upside-down star, I guess. Yeah. But uh, the star there with it makes it look like the Dallas Cowboys is like evil Dallas yeah. Cowboys hockey <laughs> or something it's strange. but. Style. <laughs> uh, I would see it like that, and uh, uh, why well, I'm looking like this because he's there, so I'm trying to oh, remember. That's, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's cool. It's very clean. And first time we had guest vocals, we had uh, Thomas Lindbergh on the Devil Gate Ride. Yep. And we brought in Mika Luttinen from uh, Impen Nazarene on the yeah. Total Save. And Total, Total Save is the jam. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of songs there that have been sort of live classics, that, that, so it's a, it's a very important album for us. I think we will be lynched if we wouldn't play Total Satan. <laughs> and, and so, uh, it, uh, I love people singing along to it, and uh, so uh, yeah, it's uh, I only have good memories of it. Yeah, you know, we've been covering so much. Uh, you know, there's a few things that I even missed when we brought up uh, Witchery. Impaled Nazarene would have been the other comparison I would have I would have brought into the mix when we were talking about the Crown and, and contemporaries at the time that were kind of doing something similar. And even though Impaled Nazarene has this kind of unique aspect to them, they obviously carry that punk attitude and, and punk rock uh, uh, vibe in their music as they had continued on. And uh, so I kind of threw you guys a Witchery. And even though you guys were all unique to your to yourself, it didn't sound like each other. I, it would have been cool to have a tour those three bands together. You know, really melt the face off of everybody. Um, and going back to Hell Is Here, something that I forgot because I think our recording got messed up is: uh, was there all. any inspiration uh, from this Overkill record with the uh, <laughs> the Hell Is Here? That ain't the Overkill record. <laughs> I think it could be because on that album we we sort of went for that we we weren't afraid to be cliche yeah so so uh there's a lot of over-the-top stuff on there even lyric wise and title wise and so it's uh i'm not sure sure some overkill there but uh afterwards i remember someone was asking me were you influenced by that uh monster magnet album do you remember that there was an album they released uh -huh. and there was a song burning hand there and uh, and i think it was released like power trip i think power trip so, we have to look it up now. Yeah, so uh, that could have been involved there as well. So, uh, but yeah, the the whole idea that is Jan's hand actually. Yeah. Okay. Craft in the kitchen with the kitchen light on. <laughs> 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 then sent the art guy to add the stuff on it. So uh, yeah, it was cool to come from a very serious. I mean, Eternal Death is so super serious in every way. Right. Uh, there's not a jingle, single black humor in there. It's so fucking serious satanic shit, <laughs> you know? Right, right. So going to something like something like fucking rock and roll cliche, it felt 
like the right thing to do, you know. Yeah, yeah, and like again, that kind of started to spawn uh, where we're kind of talking about Black Thrash and this whole rejuvenation. I, yeah. I could see that album as kind of being like the legendary album, you know, that everyone wants to sound like this kind of thing, you know, and, and I, even. You know, you can compare it to some Destroyer 666, and, you know, you could bring some other bands in the mix that kind of have that rock and roll, black metal vibe that have done it successfully. Uh, but Yeah, but they all seem to do, even Destroyer still has, I think, some blatant, like, they don't do the oom. I think they have umlauts. They have umlaut, man. See, so, like, there's shit, like, because, dude, like, Death Race, it's like, when you look at it, and I, I think this is the key which so i mean again so there's all the props happening here i'll give the props for yeah not being blatantly obvious because when you look at it it looks strangely familiar yeah but it, that's as far as it gets is strangely familiar <laughs> right. because there's no well like because obviously like, you know born to race probably some sort of you know born to die or whatever the, you know yeah, the yeah. That, so it's like switch it up but even the race aspect but basically like there's no like bitch get on your knees sleazy shit that everybody right. fucking with umlauts does to the point of no umlauts to where it's just a, a totally boring topic yeah uh, that you know this is kind of in that realm and it just doesn't go there and yeah. like it still even has some of the satan stuff where then it doesn't even do the but it's that black humor kind of yeah k- kitsch but that, even that like the, you know what I mean? about. like the motorhead worshiper the umlaut bands if they're going to touch satan it's going to be more or less like you know of the tone of like hey we're having a drink with satan and like that yeah. just gets lame or like the whole sleazy girl rape thing and yeah like, all that. Like, like i don't even understand it's, yeah. it's just boring at that right. point and that's that I, I like that that this doesn't do shit like that and, yeah this and, is like fist pumping beer guz- guzzling you know crank on 11 metal you know without saying any of that yeah so without you don't, saying if you're it, not yeah. the beer drinker you don't give a fuck about that which i am but i still don't want to really hear that <laughs> um it, it's great for that you know yeah. what i mean you get what you want you it, it's it, it's just it's stripped of the stupid like well, analogies they did it right. they and did narrations it way. yeah they did it yeah, right yeah and, yeah you know and uh, <laughs> you know uh, not to make Marco feel uncomfortable there, but uh, just keep nodding your head and taking well, the I, taking the uh, praise. You know, you were praising the, this whole damn time. Well, it was my turn, uh, damn it. Well, it's true. It is true. And, and again, I think they are overlooked because you know, even admittedly yourself, you weren't like the hugest uh, follower of the Crown. Um, you are a little bit younger too, so I think maybe that had something to do with it. Because back when this stuff was happening, there weren't as many bands to right. be connected to, and so for me, it was like right in my fucking face. Uh, so, you know, I'm sure that has to do with it, too. So, again, uh, we're just, yeah, big fan, big fan of, of, of your whole discography. And uh, something else I wanted to mention, because I'm involved in it, is your son has now followed in your footsteps, which is kind of crazy, at the same age, seemingly, as you started The Crown, right? 14? I mean, it seems, like, it seems like he's uh, he's going down the same path almost. We're close in age, uh, with 14, 16, whatever. But uh, if you want to give him a little shout on this, I'll let you handle that. (laughs) Yeah, it's really funny because one would think that I have sort of sat with him for years and forced him to like all the fucking metal bands. But, you know, if you have kids, you know, it doesn't work like that. It just happens. Yeah. So uh, he showed very early a lot of interest in metal. And uh, Mm -hmm. he's went through the phases. I mean, he... At one time, he enjoyed the Norwegian black metal bands or whatever, and uh, now he's into yeah. the trash and, uh, you know, whatever. He's all over the place. So, uh, yeah, he fucking ended up joining a band. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> the scary thing is that it's so fucking good. <laughs> yeah, and he can play. Like, I, you know, I don't know if anyone follows uh, Marco on uh, Instagram, but you should. It's It's pretty cool. He'll sit in the studio. Him and his son, yeah. they'll play through some Crown stuff sometimes. They'll play through some maybe Metallica or Slayer. And, you know, obviously you, you played through some Sarkitar. Sar- Sar- I can't even say yeah. fucking fast. Sarkitar. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, so it's really cool to, to see, what you you know, you guys kind of interacting together. And, you know, it's a cool yeah. little bond that you guys have that I think is pretty unique. Yeah, it's brilliant. It's really amazing because, uh, yeah, as you said, we, we can just sit and jam. And the thing is that the kid has come to the sort of, level of understanding the all metal that I can discuss I can discuss with him about the the typical metal stuff that I would discuss with Magnus or whatever you know <laughs> he knows everything and he corrects me when I'm wrong also so oh uh, that's funny that's pretty <laughs> awesome so that's really cool so uh, yeah I, I see a really interesting future for him if he's interested in this because 
that's all the thing. The only thing in his head right now is music. Right. Music. music. He constantly writes music, and uh, he writes some really good music, and he introduces me to a lot of music, uh, like uh, Hell Ripper, as I Right. You. Yeah, Hell Ripper. Yeah, Reaper Metal Productions. Oh, really? Now on Peaceful. Yeah. That's right. He's super into Hell Ripper. Yeah. Oh, killer. Well, yeah. James will be stoked. So, uh, he usually makes like playlists for me that I listen to when I'm out running. So he introduces a lot of new bands to me because uh, I tend to listen to the, you know, the old stuff. Yeah, right. <laughs> so um, yeah, it's it's gonna be really cool. And uh, they just yeah, we've done two recordings that ended up as a tape, as you know. Yes. Redefining and, darkness. And, yeah. Yeah. Sold out pretty and, quickly. Actually, you might have to repress that. Yeah. And we are right now, uh, not we, they are right now looking into uh, their debut album. Yeah. Also, we Redefining Find Darkness. Darkness. Yeah. Yeah, I'm excited so, uh, for it. I just saw the cover art and everything, and I, it's not been officially revealed yet, but uh, yeah, it's looking yeah. promising. So. Uh, cool. um, unfortunately, the corona bullshit got in the way. Yes. Uh, uh, we were supposed to go in uh, next uh, Friday to record oh, wow. the drum. It's not going to happen. Right. Uh, but it's going to happen as soon as we possibly can do it. So uh, they asked me to uh, produce it. So it's going to be, yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. Maybe I know. A, maybe a guest lead most, from Dad. Maybe. No, I was going to say you can do the drums now. <laughs> oh yeah, you can do the drums. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no guest lead from Dad. I'm not going to get involved. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm there to support them <laughs> if, if they want some help or guidance. But uh, I really want them to make their own stupid mistakes and right. learn. Right. So, uh, it's gonna be. It's got very really interesting. Uh, I probably heard all of their new stuff, and uh, yeah, it's 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 frighteningly good. <laughs> uh, I'm excited, man. I'm excited. You know how I feel about it already, which is even kind of how we've come to know each other, and uh, you know, so that's been a cool thing for me as a, as a fan. But I I genuinely liked what they were doing before <laughs> before I even like uh, started nerd, nerding out with you. So I think that's the cool thing is it's genuine. I think they're doing a great job and anything I can do to help kind of propel that, um, yeah. you know, not to, not to talk about, you know, redefining or anything. That's not the so, point of this, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, so I'm, I'm equally excited to, to hear the new stuff and be a part of it. And, and we'll look forward to a non uh, non viral outbreak world. You don't need to release an album for me to be looking forward yeah. to that. <laughs> um, one thing I wanted to ask real quick, uh, hopefully, is Marcus, who used to play in the band. I was wondering where he ended up. I know he was doing, uh, I think he filled in with maybe In Flames for a little while. I can't remember some band. It, it filled in with a few bands. I uh, can't remember who else. But uh, And then that Angle project that he did, right? And is he still doing anything right now? Yeah, uh, that was basically what happened, was that while we were still doing Crown, he joined Engel as a full member. Oh, so, okay. uh, so um, at first it worked out, but in the end the, the conflicts were too brutal. Uh, I mean, cancelling shows due to the fact that he was playing in two bands, it, yeah. it, wasn't, it wasn't okay. Right. Uh, so... Um, we need to find a new way there, and uh, it's also incredible there how lucky we were finding Robin because he's also one hell of a super shredder and such a nice guy. And the thing is that, I mean, as I said very early, it, it's all about inbreed, and uh, Robin is actually my ex-wife's cousin. <laughs> so <laughs> crazy! <laughs> inbreeding that's going on in Sweden. That's crazy. So, uh, yeah, so I know Robin forever, so he's also like a super cool guy and so fucking good i mean the solo on cobra speed venom is yeah, absolutely insane cool. yeah totally insane so, uh, so uh yeah we, we just couldn't make it work with marcus anymore are, so, you, are you still friendly or are you still cool uh i actually haven't <laughs> spoken with him <laughs> well, maybe we shouldn't talk about that <laughs> <laughs> I always, I always like, liked his guitar playing, so that's just why I brought it up when we saw him live. I was like, holy shit, man, how's he playing so fucking yeah. fast and playing all these leads perfect yeah. over all this, you know? So. Yeah, he's great. He's perfect. Yeah. 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 Super shredder. Yeah, totally. Well, cool, man. Uh, 
I'm pretty much done. I don't know if you got anything to plug, uh, Marco, while you're on here, but uh, you know, we can give you a, a minute here if you, you need to plug anything. If you, you know, you, you're available for studio work or anything, please uh, shout that out. But uh, otherwise, I'm going to hand it to Reaper. I think we covered my life here. <laughs> <These hours. laughs> the most in-depth I, interview ever. All you got to do is, is give anyone the YouTube link if they want to know about the band or your history. Just just watch yeah. this. We don't need to talk. Yeah, well, there you go. So this has been the Into the Darkness interview series that we were doing here on the uh, on the Reaper Metal Productions band. Are you, oh, my God, man, I can't talk. Cut. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, cut. cut. There you go. Do it again. But yeah, so we, we definitely went straight into the darkness, and that's exactly what we do on this. We just spend a lot of time and really go through things, no matter where they will go naturally. So if you like this, definitely do everything you got to do here while you're on YouTube, and that is subscribe, like, and all that stuff that I should not have to remind you of doing. And when you do that, that will give you everything we need to do to talk to you next time. And I was looking at the wrong camera while yeah. I did that. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs>